Good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for 2024. The first item in the, on the agenda is consideration of whether to take items 6, 7 and 8 in private. Item 6 is the consideration of evidence heard today on the Environmental Standards Scotland's investigation. Item 7 is the consideration of a draft report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum on the UK Passenger Railway Services Public Ownership Bill. And item 8 is the consider of a con consideration of the contract in relation to our advisor on environmental standards. Do we agree to take those items in private? We are agreed. So item 2 is the consideration of a draft statutory instrument, the Vehicle Emissions Trading Schemes Amendment Order 2024. And I'd like to welcome Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport. I also welcome the Scottish Government officials joining us for this item. Michelle West, the Solicitor, and Matthew Eastwood, the Head of EV Infrastructure, Low Carbon Directorate from Transport Scotland. The instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means it cannot come into force unless the Parliament approves it. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion to recommend that the instrument be approved. I remind everyone that the Scottish Government officials, of course, can speak under this item, but not in the debate that follows. Cabinet Secretary, I think you want to make a short opening statement. I say that always in hopefulness, but uh, Cabinet Secretary, over to you. Um, thank you, thank you Convener. Good morning, Committee. Uh, and I always strive to be brief. Uh, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to discuss the Draft Vehicle Emissions Trading Schemes Amendment Order 2024, extending the territorial extent of these trading schemes to include Northern Ireland. In 2019, the Scottish Government declared a climate emergency and announced that Scotland would address this challenge by working collaboratively to decarbonise all areas of the Scottish economy to reach net zero emissions by 2024. 45. Transport is the largest contributor to Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, making up to 31.7% of all emissions in 2022, with road transport contributing to 70% of those emissions. That is why, working with the UK Government and the Welsh Government, we passed the Vehicle Emissions Trading Schemes Order 2023, which came into force in Scotland from January 2024. This committee uh, recommended to the Scottish Parliament that we approve the 2023 order on the 21st of November 2023. This uh, devolved legislation mirrored legislation introduced by the UK Government and the Welsh Government to create a Great Britain-wide set of mechanisms to increase the sale of zero-emission cars and vans and reduce emissions of new non-zero emission cars and vans. So, working closely with the UK Government and the devolved governments of Wales and Northern Ireland, we are now bringing forward a draft vehicle emissions trading schemes amendment order 2024 to extend this scheme to Northern Ireland, supported by the UK Climate Change Committee and now before you today for consideration. The vehicle emissions trading schemes put legal obligations on car and van manufacturers. Firstly, the zero emission vehicle mandate sets annual targets of sales of new zero emission vehicles ramping up to 80% of new car and 70% of new van sales in 2030. In parallel, the CO2 trading schemes incentivises manufacturers to continue to drive down the emissions of non-zero emission cars and vans. The UK Government analysis estimates that through these schemes alone, there will be a saving of 420 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions across the UK by 2050, with 40 million tonnes of carbon dioxide saved in Scotland. Since the introduction of the Vehicle Emissions Trading Scheme legislation across Great Britain earlier this year, fully electric cars now account for 17.2% of total sales. There are now over 96,000 electric vehicles on Scotland's roads. Over 62,000 are fully electric. Vehicle manufacturers and charge point operators have called for clarity, consistency and ambition from government. The Vehicle Emissions Trading Schemes have provided this clarity and in part due to increasing private sector investment in public EV charging infrastructure. As of the end of August, Scotland now has over 5,900 charge points and will be certainly meet its target of 6,000 and public charging points by 2026. So today we are just seeking to your support to extend the vehicle emissions trading schemes to include Northern Ireland and I therefore invite the committee to improve the draft legislation to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm just looking around to see if there's any questions. I, just help me slightly if you wouldn't mind. I think I heard 
uh, the tail end of last week about the fact that uh, electric vehicle sales were actually not going as fast as they should be and there was a cry for more work to be taken by the UK government. Is, is that your feeling? Um, I'm just interested yeah, so in... Mark, in I, mean, I might bring Matthew in this. So in terms of where it's heading, there definitely has been an uptake and I think the, the, obviously the scheme has assisted that. Um, there is sort of anecdotal different views as to where the market is. I think the used electric market is in a much stronger position in terms of used pricing being similar for electric and, and um, um, your, uh, carbon vehicles. Uh, so there's mixed, there's mixed messages, I think, where the market is. I, I could understand the desire from the manufacturers to try and incentivise more because obviously it saves them from any penalties or increased kind of charges they would have to have under the scheme. Um, of course, we've been the only country in the UK that actually has had incentives to help in people um, you know, in terms of taking out loans for electric vehicles. So I suspect what they're trying to do with the new UK, gov new UK government is to do something similar to what we are doing. We are particularly now targeting those people um, uh, whose you know, earnings are under £50,000, who are living in rural and island areas, for example, as well, in order to make sure that our loan scheme is being quite targeted. So I, I suspect it's that somewhere um, I, I'm not going to be definitive as where the market is, uh, but I, I've heard different views. But I think it's reasonably buoyant and moving. The issue is, I suspect the manufacturers would like the comfort of it moving faster. So I suspect the truth is somewhere in between there. But Matthew, can you shed some light on what the current situation is? They do it for you. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, September uh, this year was the best ever year in the UK for the sale of electric vehicles. Greater than one in five vehicles sold was an EV, so it's the best ever year for EV sales. Uh, EV sales in the UK outpaced uh, EV sales in equivalent markets uh, in the European Union, which doesn't have a similar scheme. Regulations in the European Union focus on uh, vehicle emissions, so driving down the average emissions of a petrol and diesel car, Whereas in the UK we have the, um, the, the VETS uh, regulations, which mandate the sale of electric vehicles, which, why, which is why we've seen uh, proportionally greater sales of EVs in the UK compared to similar markets in other parts of the world. Helpful, Matthew. Uh, you used UK figures. Do you have, how's it going in Scotland, specifically? Uh, Sorry, Matthew. You, you, you. We don't yet have uh, specific figures for uh, Scotland um, for September. We should have those shortly and we can provide you with those figures. Uh, but we understand they are similar to UK figures in terms of uptake of EVs. And one of the issues we have to bear in mind is uh, we think there's an underestimate of the Scottish figures because if it's through a kind of fleet and purchasing that is centred in England, it will count as an English uh, figure. So therefore we think it will be, it's far more than that and there's been recent studies to, to identify that. So just there's a bit of a caveat in our figures as well. Health, health warning, on, health warning. On, on, yeah. on the figures. Right, Bob wants to come in and then Mark. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I wasn't going to come in until you mentioned uh, 6,000 EV charging points uh, by 2026 when Scottish Target. I had been contacted uh, in recent months by a constituent who is a wheelchair user who requires a, a PAS 1899 standard uh, charging bay. Uh, I know that's quite technical, but Matthew, you should see us thought maybe an opportunity to ask that question. I believe Glasgow has only installed four so far, all at one location. And correspondence with Glasgow, I think they're keen to do much better than that. But one barrier convener to, to all of this is to make sure the charging points are not just available, but also accessible, Mr Eastwood, I know it's the cabinet, I know it's your responsibility, but given that Mr Eastwood's here, I thought that was a reasonable thing to put on the record and to get additional information well, I'll, on. I'll bring Matthew in, but it might be helpful. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to figures and, and definitions of charging points. Can somebody explain what sort of charging point that is? Is it not just a simple one? Sorry, Matthew, you nodded when he, when he gave that figure. It would help me to understand it. So I think the figure you're referring to is... Uh, public charge points, uh, so that's charge points that are available for uh, public use by members of the public as opposed to charge points for fleet vehicles or a charge point that would be in a domestic uh, uh, setting. Oh. Yeah, yeah, so, so you know, what, what I was keen to know is that I've got a constituent who wishes to buy a, an electric car, 
uh, requires, I think it's past 1899 standard charging points, so they can, there's enough space and, and infrastructure to actually charge their car out with their home. And we're not doing very well on that at the moment. I'm just wondering whether that's on the radar of government and what the target is moving forward to do better. Okay, so the Scottish Government doesn't provide the charging points. We provide funding to help different public bodies, local authorities, um, and, in, and in some cases separately, homes and businesses, etc. Uh, we have an electric vehicle um, inf infrastructure fund worth £30 million. We've already let that. Uh, some of that funding has already been released to different authorities, for example, Dundee and Highland. I announced that earlier in the summer. Glasgow is one of the um, applications that is currently being considered. I suspect if, in, t in terms of that issue, that's an issue that you might want to raise directly with Glasgow yeah. um, City Council to ensure that the provisions that they are asking, that they want to use that funding for, <coughs> which also is to generate private funding. Um, so I, I would point out that we've managed, we, we think this year there will be about 40 to £50 million pounds of private funding involved in uh, EV charging, but specifically on the details of the type of provision. I think we all want to make sure that EV charging is accessible, but the responsibilities for delivering that would be for Glasgow, um, uh, Glasgow City Council. I would also point out convener, that there are regulations that are responsible to the UK government that um, were, um, you know, came, came forward in last November, and in terms of regulations of EV charging, that's a reserved matter. That, that's really helpful, Cabinet Secretary. I, I think the Scottish Government had an official helping develop those, those UK-wide regulations, is my understanding, that may just be the, the past 1899 standard convener has only recently been alive in terms of uh, these EV bays. I'm, I'm, I'm really corresponding with Glasgow City Council. I'll continue that, Cabinet Secretary. I suppose taking a step back, there's 32 local authorities, and we've got a nationwide endeavour to make sure those are accessible for wheelchair users and others with disabilities as well. And how would the Scottish Government collate that information going forward? Um, Mark, you had a question, I believe. Um, two quick questions. Um, one is about the former Prime Minister's announcement on the phase out of um, fossil fuel cars and whether you know, that has had any bearing on, on UK policy or whether UK policy is pretty much predictable, you know, there hasn't been any changes um, in relation to, to the measure we're talking about today or whether it has introduced some uncertainty within that. Um, it, <clears throat> this scheme would operate separately from that anyway, and it's, right. there's not an interdependency, so I think the scheme is actually achieving, which is good. In terms of what the UK government's view is on, on phasing out, that's a matter for them to to obviously really, um, they had a manifesto commitment, it would be up to, to their ministers um, to, to relay what their position will be in timing or, or, or what they would intend to do with that. But, but I would point out that um, on Thursday I met with uh, two of the UK, the new UK, incoming UK government ministers, including the future uh, of Roads Minister, and obviously this is obviously a, an issue that they were having to address as to what they might do, but that would be a, an issue that we will hear from them from. It's not my, my place to, to speak for, for okay. them. Okay, that's fine. And then the other issue was about um, local councils and the ability of householders and businesses to connect to an EV, you know, charging um, within their within their home, within their business, to the car, which is or van that is sitting outside on the public highway. And I know there are planning issues around cables crossing footways, but I know of a number of local authorities that have provided effectively a kind of derogation to enable, you know, certain kind of gutters to be put onto the footway to enable homeowners, businesses to actually charge, you know, at home using a preferable, you know, cheap tariff. So I'm just wondering if there's any progress in terms of getting councils to adopt more, um, you know, enlightened planning rules around that to enable people to use, the, use their, uh, you know, their, their, their more attractive EV tariffs that they can get from... So clearly this, this is about the VET scheme and extend it to Northern Ireland. Obviously, as soon as you start talking about electric vehicles, yeah. everybody <laughs> automatically you know, switches into to charging because that's obviously what gives people confidence in terms of uh, purchase and understand the, the connection there. Um, so in terms of um, those issues, they are live, they are current. Um, I've asked my officials to, to ensure that in terms of planning, is there anything that we can do to help assist on that? Um, I've had a very interesting visit to, to see Trojan. A company has got quite innovative in terms of how they're looking at pavement um, charging. Going back to the kind of point about 
we obviously have to make sure, and that's where I think there's concerns about making sure um, dis, you know, disabled people have access and not in pin, you know, and not, not, you know, there's no kind of um, obstruction to them. And mm -hmm. I think that's the, the key to make sure that we can do that. And the Trojan one was very interesting. It was like a, um, you know, it's, it was flat flush, but with a um, almost like a Hoover-like extension that you keep in your car and then you charge in. There are guttering. Um, proposals are mm. different. Area, you know, there are different things that can be done. I think the trick to try and help people with um, that don't have driveways is going to be one of the key things to, to help in the uptake. So I've asked my officials to look very closely as to you know what's happened, and so that's a, a piece of work I've asked them to, right. to carry out. Yeah. This is always the problem, Cabinet Secretary, when you come to a meeting and we, we never have enough time in our programme to see as much as we like. We get lots of questions. I've got Monica uh, followed by Douglas and then we'll see where we go from there. Monica. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of uh, brief questions about some of the minor um, amendments um, that would come into effect. So one is that um, it would allow hydrogen powered fuel cell vehicles to be classified as zero emission vehicles under the VET scheme. Um, so I just wonder, is that something that you welcome? Will it bring any challenges? And given that you've um, told us some figures for electric vehicles, um, do you have um, update figures on hydrogen powered fuel vehicles in Scotland? Um, so clearly hydrogen is considered to be more appropriate for heavy goods vehicles. Uh, we recently now, uh, we recently published the um, HGV, uh, truck, you know, one of the outcomes of the HGV truck task force where we, we've done it first in the UK to do a plotting of where EV charging could be for HGV fleets and hydrogen. So it's a mix of both. Where, if you had them, where would they be? In logistically sharing information, which is quite a challenge with what a competitive market of HGVs. But actually we've done very well working with the, that sector. Obviously, um, there's you know, speculation of hydrogen in other parts, less so obviously in cars and vans. And obviously this is about cars and vans. My understanding was the, and this was before I came in, um, the, I'm in, in responsibility for this area. My understanding was the VET scheme was always meant to be technology neutral. So this amendment is just to ensure that it is technology neutral, because as you point out, the original version would have precluded hydrogen, but this one um, enables it. But I think we're, we have some way to go before you see the development of um, hydrogen, uh, in, particularly in cars and vans, which is the subject of, of this scheme. And then just um, noting that this would also ensure um, there's a financial penalty um, where someone's provided false or misleading information under Article 87 of the VETS 2023 order. Um, so again, I assume that's something that you welcome, but I just wonder in terms of the enforcement side of things, um, what... Um, I suppose resource and intelligence is in place for that, and who would be responsible for um, that side of things? Well, clearly that's um, UK responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think you know we can point out we do not manufacture um, cars in Scotland anymore, and indeed the former British Leyland site, um, which was a manufacturing outlet, was in is in my constituency. It's now a massive housing scheme, so therefore the manufacturing, which is obviously this is about sale from manufacturers, is mm -hmm. primarily targeted. Um, in England, and obviously in terms of enforcement penalties, etc., um, that would be the responsibility of the UK government. That's I just wanted to know if there's any um, duties on the Scottish government or any implications. Um, is there anything? Uh, no, there's no duties on the Scottish government. It's the DFT that's responsible for administering the scheme. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, thanks, Just a of questions, um, Cabinet Secretary. One was around like plug-in <laughs> hybrids, which can obviously be zero emission or they could be running on petrol all day. How were they handled within the, the VET scheme or if at all? Do you want to cover that one? Uh, yep, yeah, certainly. Um, the, the VET scheme includes provision for uh, plug-in hybrids as well and uh, certainly the UK government position uh, on uh, plug-in hybrids is that they form part of the solution in the context of VETs but also in the context of the, uh, the, the ban on uh, vehicles as well. So, so they would be, are they, would they be part of the ban going forward or, or not? Um, I think the intention is to phase out the sale of, um, uh, under VETS, to phase out the sale ultimately of all fossil fuel powered vehicles. But there's, uh, there's acknowledgement in the uh, regulations that there'll be a period when they're still allowed to be sold after uh, 
after the time that uh, we won't see um, uh, vehicles that are exclusively powered by fossil fuels no longer sold and no longer on UK roads. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Other question I had was, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned about the 6,000 and 30,000 targets for EV charging points. Just to provide a little bit of clarity, obviously that, I don't think that includes home chargers at all. It's all public available chargers, but that's not just chargers provided by local authorities, that may be chargers provided by service stations and supermarkets. Is that, is that correct? So in terms of the um, target, you're correct. It doesn't include home or, or businesses. It's about you know, publicly accessible chargers. Um, it, in terms of that expansion, uh, when I, it was one of the first things I did when I came into post as Minister for Transport was to launch our EV vision um, for, you know, for charging. And in terms of um, that uh, target, we're wanting to ensure that we maximise private as well as public uh, provision. That's why you know, the EV infrastructure fund that we're we are you know, rolling out as we speak um, is ensuring that there's a combination and there can be a combination and it's leverage it's about how do we leverage in private funding to to the provision of uh, public chargers uh, so therefore in terms of you know meeting our, our initial target of, of for 2026 we're well on the way for that and um, very struck that figures from the Scottish Futures Trust showed that in 2023 the, the level of private investment was about 25 to 30 million roughly and this year they're anticipating it'll be 40 million to 50 million I opened the rapid charging um, provision in Dundee for example um, which obviously has private sector lead mm -hmm. OK, and the uh, other question I had was uh, oh, sometimes here now about charging price inequalities, where if you're charging your EV at home, it's one price, but you know, if you're charging at a service station, for example, it could be like 10 times higher. And you know, that's obviously a, an issue. If you don't have, you know, as I think Bob Doris had mentioned, if you, if you can't charge it at home, then you're actually, well, not well, almost like penalising people that they can't do that. So are you looking into that? And is there any studies being done around the inequalities around that? So I think this is a point about the kind of evolution of, of, of charging. Originally, obviously, having free charging was an incentive for people to, to use. And there was some provision initially in, in terms of free charging. Um, obviously, different providers in terms of, we just talked about the private investment, they've obviously a return on, on, from, the, from the charging area, but obviously there, there are differences in, in pricing in terms of the market for this. Clearly, if you can use cheaper energy from home, and particularly at the times where it's cheaper to, you know, to, to source energy anyway, that's obviously ideal, which obviously makes the premium on how can you charge when you don't have access um, you know, in, in your driveway because you don't have a driveway. So that's why I'm particularly interested in what we can do for on street. Um, there are there are some innovations on on street that's not that are not necessarily using domestic pricing. But for example, in Haddington, I was there when the um, there was the the first development of using the um, the green furniture used by you know BT previously or Open Reaches, and then converting that to to being able to access charging, and that helped for a scheme in, in a housing scheme in Haddington that's near the edge of the town, and so they don't have to drive into town to charge, etc. But ideally, as we've discussed previously, I think we can get a sea change if we can help support um, the on-street parking. We've already had funding available for factors to enable, um, you know, when there's tenemental. Uh, provision trying to provide kind of chargers that can be uh, done on a collective basis. Uh, so that's something we've already tried to, to, to look at in terms of how do you help support people in, in, that, in that area. Do you think there's a role for government to play in terms of regulation to stop people getting ripped off by going to some EV points that are, as I say, I, I 10 times is, more I, than I would, would be to, to charge at home? Um, so, so in terms of the EV regulation, as I pointed out, that's a responsibility of the, the UK government. Okay. I think we're drifting away slightly. We could get on to the pricing of uh, electricity for charging cars in the Parliament, which, of course, is free, which I've never really understood. So if there's no more questions, um, we'll move on to agenda item three, which is a debate on motion S6M14319, calling on the committee to consider and recommend approval of this draft. Uh, order. I'm going to ask the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion. I'm happy if you just want to move the motion. I'm happy to move the motion that the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee recommends that the Vehicle Emissions <coughs> Trading Schemes Amendment Order 2024 draft be approved. Thank you. Uh, are there any contributions from members over and above the debate? 
No. Um, thank you. Uh, I Cabinet Secretary, I fear there's nothing for you to sum up uh, to, but do you want to sum up in, in any shape or form? No, you have a very full agenda. Uh, Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So the question is that motion S6M14319 in the name of Fiona, Fiona Hislop, sorry, Fiona Hislop be approved. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The committee will report on the outcome of this instrument in due course. And I invite committee members to delegate authority to me as convener to approve the draft for publication. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, to you and your officials. In the interest of time, I'm going to move straight on to the next item while you and your uh, team move on. Uh, agenda item four is consideration of three negative instruments. These are laid under the negative procedure, which means they will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul them. No motions to annul have been lodged. The Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee had no comment and on any of them in its report, um, and I'll seek views on each in turn. First is the Local Services Franchise Traffic Commissioner Notices and Panel Scotland Regulations. Um, do any members have any comments on these instruments? Mark, you were quick with your hand there. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I do have a concern about the Local Services Franchises um, SSI. I mean, obviously, this concerns bus franchising. Um, there's been, I think it's fair to say, a pretty checkered history about how bus franchises have been rolled out across the UK. Um, you know, I'm aware that this SSI comes from the 2019 Transport Act, but I'm also aware that there's currently a parliamentary petition um, before the Parliament from the Get, Get Glasgow Moving campaign who raised significant concerns around the process that this SSI sets out, in particular the role of effectively unelected officials in deciding whether a franchise could go ahead or not. So I think you know, we're at quite a critical time. Uh, I know that Strathclyde Passenger Transport are looking into the potential around franchising. Uh, this would be a, a significant investment for them just to do that preparatory work. And there is a need for clarity about how this would work, whether there would be any unintentional or intentional biases within the panel that's, a, that's appointed, any conflicts of interest. So I do think it's important that this committee takes evidence, certainly from the petitioners, um, certainly from those who've got experience of how similar franchising decision-making processes have been working down south, uh, and, and, and we reflect on that ahead of you know, Parliament effectively making a decision to let this SSI pass um, or, or not, as the case might be. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, all the hands are going up. Monica first, then Bob. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm also mindful of the, the petition by Get Glasgow Moving that's with the Public Petitions Committee. Um, and I agree that we do need further evidence on this. I, I certainly have a number of questions that we're not going to get answers to today talking to ourselves. Um, and I think these concerns are, are shared more widely. Um, I'm not entirely sure about some of the things that have happened in, in England, and I think the legislation may have, have changed, um, but we need to try and bottom that out and also understand the role of the Traffic Commissioner in, in this too. Um, so I would welcome more, more evidence and to hear from some of the key, key stakeholders, including Get Glasgow Moving. Uh, thanks, Monica. Uh, Bob, you're next. Thank you, um, convener. I, I think the Get Glasgow Moving uh, Petition at Petitions Committee is a really interesting one. Uh, uh, initially, it would appear to be looking to uh, redraw primary legislation if it was to move through Parliament and, and be successful. We're looking at secondary legislation today for something that I think was agreed in 2019 by the Parliament. So there's a connection between that petition and what we're looking at today, but I don't think it's a direct one. Convener, the Petitions Committee have to be allowed to decide how they wish to scrutinise that petition and go forward in, in relation to that. The question I've got in my head, convener, is if we don't pass uh, or allow this negative instrument to, to move forward, there would be no pathway to franchising uh, bus services in, in Scotland. And I'm very mindful of SPT's ambitions uh, to, to improve uh, the bus service via franchising in in Glasgow, but I do agree, I think, uh, with Matt Ruskell, MSP, we will need more information 
in relation to how all this works. It's very reasonable for Get Glasgow Moving, I think, to seek clarity in the role of the Traffic Commissioner and the, 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 the panel that would be appointed and the criteria under which they may or may not make, make decisions. So there's absolutely a need for more information, but I'm just want to put on record there's there's two there's two moving parts here I think convener. One is the the the, the commendable efforts of Get Glasgow moving to seek a wider scrutiny role in the Parliament in relation to primary legislation that's already been passed in this place and this secondary legislation we're looking at to provide a pathway to bus franchising. So connected but not directly connected, but absolutely to welcome more information from the Scottish Government uh, and get some clarity around the role of the Traffic Commission would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Douglas. Oh. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with, with Mark and, and Bob today. I think we need to hear from both sides of this argument. I think it would be good to hear from the Scottish Government as well. I think that's what uh, Bob Doris was um, recommending. So I think it's, it's clear that we need to have a, another evidence session um, before we should move, move forward with this. Thanks, Douglas. Um, does anyone else have any comments? OK, um, we find ourselves in a difficult situation, I suspect, uh, just talking this through. Um, that the commencement date, as I understand it, is the 1st of November. The next evidence uh, session that we could have is the 29th of October, which also clashes with the uh, Stage 2 uh, debate on the uh, Climate Change Bill. And in the middle of all that comes recess. And if anyone wanted to, and I'm not uh, inciting riot, if that's the right description, but if a motion to annul would have to be laid, it would have to be before the uh, committee session, so it would have to be done on the 28th. Um, so the question is, uh, Bob, I'll come to you in a minute, if I may. The question is, I notice there's three and, and th people who, who feel more evidence might be needed. Bob has suggested it might. Um, is this something that we could do in writing? Uh, prior to the committee meeting uh, so we could get that evidence and then make a decision uh, whether we needed to take evidence on the 29th or is it or do you feel mark you and monica and douglas as you have you mentioned it that it actually requires an evidence session I, i'd be interested in your views mark i, I think it requires an evidence session yeah monica yeah i'd agree i'm in with the committee's got a big workload but i think it's important Douglas, I think we need uh, more information. I'm just trying to think, though, could uh, a motion for annulment be laid, but then once we hear the evidence, then that actually be removed? It, indeed, it could be. A motion to annul can be laid, and it doesn't have to be moved on yeah. the day, is my understanding of it. Uh, so it could be laid in advance. I'm just trying to think of time tabling. Um, I'm looking at the deputy convener whether you have any um, suggestions. I, I think writing would, would be helpful and warning people off for the 29th might be suitable. So my, my, I, I've, I've got no problem with um, you know, um, taking further evidence on the issue. I, I, my, my overarching concern here is that, is that in annulling, uh, if we were to annul this, uh, this particular order, is that there's no pathway for bus franchising. And if the view is that the existing, which was the additional safeguard that was put in in the legislation at the time, which was a transport commissioner, because there was an issue about just regional transport planning authorities doing it on their own and whether they would get that right, is that the only recourse we will then have will be uh, uh, to primary legislation to legislate for something different. So I think I'm just mindful of the, the issue of that. There needs to be a pathway towards uh, bus franchising, which I'm a fan of, which is why it was in the legislation, is that um, we, uh, there is the risk that if it was annulled and the committee agreed to it, that we're in a situation where there is no pathway to franchise in Scotland and that that would require, from my understanding, from what we've heard, primary legislation, which would, I suspect, put things back by years. OK, um, Bob. Thanks, Kavira. I, th I think the Deputy Kavira um, makes a reasonable comment in, in, in relation to the potential unintended consequences of not passing the secondary legislation. What I'd be keen to know, perhaps from government, uh, if we are, at the very least, we're clearly going to correspond, uh, Kavira, we have to establish how 
what else we may or may not do, is to find out if this was passed, um, how easy it would be for the Scottish Government to still listen to can say ongoing concerns, because the, the Public Positions Committee will do a piece of work that's separate from our committee convener, uh, and theoretically lay a supplementary a negative instrument at a later date, depending on <coughs> whether it feels there's been a, a wait. More about the process in relation to that, convener. OK. Um, can, I, can I make a suggestion here on a, on a way forward um, to see if the, this meets with the committee's approval? First of all, I think we should write and take evidence. Uh, and uh, we can do that. And I would, if we were going to do that, I would invite committee members who have questions that they'd like to get answers from uh, to submit them to the clerk so the clerks could then send that off. And we'll give a tight time scale uh, to ensure that we get a response before, uh, well, before the 28th, so then people could decide. We could then have a short evidence session on the morning of the 29th. It would mean an earlier start, but we would have to probably have the Cabinet Secretary in and uh, any witnesses that, that were recommended by the clerks, and then we could make that decision then, because we have, I, as far as I'm aware, and I'm going to look at the clerks, we have no leeway on the final date because it's going through the Parliament, so they're confirming that to me. Are, are we happy that that would be a, a reasonable way of dealing with Jackie. Question: If we are doing a stage two on the 29th, how can we do both? Um, well, there's there's an extremely good question, um, and uh, I don't know the answer to that. What I what I do know is that uh, the clerks. I think the last date for amendments on stage two. I'm just looking. Do we have a date for the? We do have a date. I know. What? The last date for amendments is the 23rd, um, so I will have a pretty good idea uh, once I've looked at the groupings with uh, the legislation team how long that will take, and we can work our way through it on time-wise. And <coughs> because of the timescale set by the Parliament, my suggestion would be we might have to do what we've done before uh, last week and look at the committee setting uh, sitting uh, while the rest of the Parliament's sitting. Jackie, I know that's not not great, but I don't see a way around this if we're going to give this proper scrutiny. Yeah, but um, I, I, can, I hear what you're saying about the 23rd, but then we can't really make a decision today not knowing what's going to happen on the 23rd. In, and it's... <sighs> in, indeed, we are slightly hamstrung by the 23rd, and we don't know actually whether the questions that are put forward by committee members will be satisfactorily answered so that they don't feel there is a need to do a, uh, an evidence session on the 29th. So, I mean, I'm afraid I don't see a way round it. I know there are all sorts of problems, but we have, Jackie, a situation, and I wasn't going to put it to a vote, I don't intend to, where uh, there, are, there appears to be three members who are uncomfortable with it. I have not disclosed my position. There appears to be three members who are relatively comfortable with it. Um, I, I may I've have missed. Not my opinion. Uh, well, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, Maybe a bad assumption. But but I think we need to take the evidence, um, and I and I would suggest that's a way forward. And we can discuss this briefly um, on timescales when we go into private session to make sure we have enough time to do it. Um, Given that it's not a perfect solution, um, can I suggest, can I ask if the committee are happy that we move forward yes. with it? Yes. Okay. Sorry? It's more than happy, I would say. Uh, content. I've still got uh, reservations. I will note the committee is content to move forward with that. The second instrument is the Bus Service Improvements Partnership Multi Operator Travel Card Scotland Regulations 2024. Does anyone have any comments on that? Um, so, no one appears to have any comments, so are you, uh, I invite the committee to agree that it doesn't wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thirdly, we'll consider the BUPS services, sorry, 
public services, PSV uh, registration of local services, bus services, improvement, partnership, service standards, divisions, appeals, Scotland regulation. That's quite a mouthful. Do any members have a view or comments on that? Uh, no, there's no comments. So I invite the committee to agree that it doesn't wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Please. We are agreed. Now, um, I'm just thinking that I think this is, this is an apposite moment to suspend the meeting briefly, to, uh, just to allow us to get ready for the panel that's about to come in. So I suspend the meeting for five minutes. Thank you.
Thank you and, and welcome back. We now move on to Agenda Item 5, which is Environmental Standards Scotland Investigation Climate Change Delivery Improvement Report. This is consideration of a Scottish Government Improvement Plan in response to an improvement report report from the Environmental Standards Scotland. The report relates to an investigation the ESS began in 2022, in May, and this is how, uh, how well supported local authorities are in contributing to statutory national climate change targets. ESS made five recommendations to the Scottish Government, four of which have indeed been resolved. Recommendation four, relating to local authorities reporting on scope three emissions, was not resolved to ESS's satisfaction. Because of this, the uh, Scottish Government had to prepare an improvement plan and lay it before Parliament, and that's what we're discussing today. And I'm pleased to welcome our first panel uh, of witnesses. I've got Silke Isbrand, the Policy Manager for Environment and Economy Team Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, COSLA, George Tarvet, the Director of Sustainable Scotland Network, Mark Roberts, the Chief Executive of Environmental Standards Scotland, Jamie McGrandless, Head of Investigations Standards Compliance for Environmental Standards Scotland, and Claire Warmby, the uh, Programme Director for Scottish Climate Intelligence Service. <clears throat> We're going to go straight into questions. You're not all getting an opening statement as much as you might like one. Um, and uh, so I'm going to just ask a very gentle one to start with. Um, can I just seek your views, uh, overall views, on the improvement plan published by the Scottish Government in September this year? Do you think it properly addresses the unresolved recommendation of the ESS report? Um, let's start on the... Yeah, we'll start on my left, your right, Silky, you, you want to go there. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members, and may I also relay the apologies from our spokesperson, Gail McGregor, who couldn't be here today um, <clears throat> to address you directly. Um, short answer to your question is um, that we published a position on the ESS investigation in December 2023, and that is still very much um, the position we have today. Um, so without actually having taken the improvement report um, that was laid by Scottish Government directly to member, I think it is fair to go by our existing position, and that existing position is very much about proportionality of reporting. Um, local authorities are very keen um, to focus in a world of stretched resources um, that they are looking to intervene where they can make the biggest impact, um, where they can make the biggest difference, where they can drive carbon reduction down the most. And I think interfering from that, uh, um, it is... It, is, it would be fair to say that the Scottish Government response is very much along those lines about proportionality um, and um, digging in where the biggest gains can be made. George, are you happy? Yeah, reasonably. Um, it's fair to say SSN, our members were pretty actively involved both in the SSN investigation and the Scottish Government uh, response, especially in the, the, the Scope 3 challenges. I think our members were essentially saying it's a very pragmatic and reasonable approach in, in, in summary. It's taking something that's quite complex and turning it into something that's quite actionable. Mark, you, you've got to be happy, are you? Morning, convener. Um, Broadly speaking, we are, we are ha relatively happy with, with the um, report that the Scottish Government has, has laid. Um, we are pleased that the Scottish Government has accepted the principle that the, the reporting of Scope 3 emissions should be um, mandatory. Um, we absolutely recognise the, um, the complexity of um, Scope 3 um, reporting and how difficult that is and as George has mentioned the, um, the work that has gone on with local authorities and, and others um, in the period since we laid our improvement report um, and we, we welcome the intention to, to mandate the um, reporting of the, the first group of types of emissions, scope 3 emissions that are listed in, in the plan. We're also pleased to see that there's work going to be undertaken to um, 
develop approaches for, for the remaining categories of emissions, what we would like to see is, is a timescale for that being, being, being completed. And given that November 2027 is um, set as sort of the date for the um, introduction of the first group of emissions to be reported, um, we would like to see a, a similar timescale being set to complete the remaining work. OK, just, just before I move on to Jamie, um, there were four other recommendations um, which that you appear to be happy with. You, just, just explain to me, please, briefly, why you are happy with the government's position on those. So in, in all our work, we, we strive to reach informal resolution with the Scottish Government or any other public body who we um, are working with on a particular issue. Um, during the course of the investigation, we managed to, to, to come to an agreement that satisfied us on, as you say, four out of the five recommendations that we made. And um, Jamie can perhaps explain in a moment how we're continuing to work with the government and monitor how, how those recommendations are being implemented. But for us, that was a very satisfactory outcome. OK. Um, Jamie, do you want to uh, just expand slightly on that and, and the overall position, if you want to? Of course. Thanks, Convener. Yes, so the, the, the other recommendations concerned the enhanced statutory guidance. Um, mandatory climate plans um, and development of a template to assist local authorities in that and an independent monitoring body to oversee holistically the whole system. So we've made some very good, the Scottish Government's conducted a lot of work into those. We've made some very good progress and we will continue to work with them in pushing that through. I, I suppose from our perspective, as Mark alluded to, the last piece of the jigsaw is mandatory scope three reporting. Okay. And uh, Claire, you, do you want to come in and comment on, on, on the uh, improvement plan and, and anything else regarding the other recommendations, if you want to. Um, yeah, so I've um, worked in public sector reporting for quite a long time now. Um, I think my position would be that I think the improvement plan that the government um, proposed for dealing with the Scope 3 emissions is reasonable in terms of the complexity that this will involve. Um, I suspect that the sticking point um, for everybody is going to be on categories one and two, which is procured goods and services and capital goods, which is by far the largest category um, and by far the most complex um, in terms of reporting. Um, I think what I think by trying to say we need an absolute kind of deadline and time scale on these, I think that's going to be problematic because at the moment we really do not have the appropriate methodologies to capture this kind of data. And we should be aware that there's kind of significant risks um, in asking local authorities to capture and use data that we don't really fully yet understand. Um, so I think that the improvement plan as laid by the government was pretty reasonable in terms of saying that this is an area that we need to think about and investigate before we decide exactly how to progress. OK, um, thank you. That was the easy question. Uh, the next question comes from Jackie Dunbar. Jackie. Thank you. Good morning, panel. I think my question is probably going to be directed more at Silky, but I'm happy for anyone if they've got a comment or view um, to, to add in. Um, just broadly speaking, what do you think the potential benefits are going to be uh, from local authorities reporting their scope three emissions? And of course, is there any challenges on the op opposite side? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Some local authorities already report on scope three emissions um, and local authorities, local authorities have got their own climate change ambitions and they choose which data they monitor to best inform their action and to help them best achieve their own targets and contribute to national targets. So local authorities as part of the public sector reporting duty which we've developed over many many years in a very collaborative way and which is just in the process of being updated. Some authorities as part of the public re um, reporting duty have captured scope three emissions. Mm -hmm. um, no local authority has captured all scope three emissions and that is reflected in the report in the improvement report by Scottish Government and what um, Claire Warmby has put forward that for some of these um, items there is no ready methodology um, <clears throat> data could potentially be misleading um, so um, 
going back to your question, um, of course there is benefit in capturing data where the data are clear, the methodologies are clear, and where there is actually benefit to the local authority that capturing these data can um, improve action, can improve, can drive down climate change targets. So what local government actually did is um, establish the, 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 the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service, um, which Claire is deeply involved in, um, as, a, as, a, as a joint project with Scottish Government. And the, the, the principal aim of this project, I mean, it's, it's heavily funded by both um, local government and Scottish Government, the principal aim of this project is to look at the key data, the key um, <clears throat> um, the key data sets that actually help local authorities intervene where they can have the biggest impact, where they can drive down carbon emissions the most. And do you think that the, the, the targets for local authorities should all be the same? You said that they've got their different climate targets. Do you think that, that it should be universal across to the local authorities? No, because um, that is the democratic mandate of each local authority, um, you know, to, to set its targets. Each local authority's elected members decide on their local ambitions. Okay. And is there any challenges for the data collection? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, possibly Claire is much better able to, to, to speak to the practical but, challenges. Yeah, but we do know me. that capturing, you know, w w what is under scope three is, 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 is heavily challenging. Some categories more than others, but some very, very challenging and potential to lead to wrong decision-making. And I think that was put forward as well. I was yesterday in a, in a discussion uh, uh, about the circular economy route map for the Scottish Government and the desire from Scottish Government to drive circular economy principles through procurement. But as laid out in the Scottish Government's report, some simplistic reporting around the amount of the volume of spend rather than the quality of spend could actually become counterproductive here. So it's a very complicated area, not easy to capture the right data. Mm -hmm. George, you looked as if yes, you wanted to come just in. To, just to build on that, I think it's fair to say in the workshops that we, that we held, there is an ambition, as Silk is indicating, some scope three is already measured and reported. I think there's an ambition, and I think the SSM members are not shirking away from the fact that they have some responsibility to look at their wider uh, impacts. Um, the challenge is when it becomes an obsession with measurement, especially annual measurement, and then things like setting targets on something that is it's, it's complex and there's a lot of moving parts. And really, I think there's benefit in terms of getting some level of measurement in order to empower engagement. So it's the interventions that are going to be important. And I think some of the conversations you've been having around things like the national Tar you know, tar targets versus budgets, really the focus needs to be on the sort of actions and the interventions. So measurement to an extent, but actually a lot of the focus is on what you're going to do with that measurement. And then it's an issue in terms of capacity, standards, um, empowering the, 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 the officers to then come up with projects and interventions that are going to be sensible. Okay, thank you. I'm big on empowerment. Thank you, convener. Uh, th thanks, Jackie. Um, I'm going to bring Mark in. I, I guess the difficulty is with a panel of five, you don't always get to answer every single question. But if, if there's something you feel very strongly about, um, just sort of raise your hand and catch my eye, and, I, and I'll try and bring you in. Uh, don't throw anything at me. That doesn't work. Mark, you want to come in? Having a look at the <clears throat> different um, you know, groups of scope three emissions, the different kind of areas, and... You know, the government has categorised some of those as being really, really hard to, to bottom out. Um, and that, that's then been scheduled for further work, right? So I've, I've understood that correctly. But I was looking at some of the, some of the groupings here, and one of them is, is franchises, operation of franchises. Is, how, how hard is it to, to work out the emissions from a franchise? Because, you know, we just had a discussion this committee earlier on about bus franchises. Um, Surely it would be quite easy, or relatively easy, for a council to work out how the operation of a bus service over time and the vehicles that would be used would contribute towards climate change, the amount of fuel that would be used, the number of services that would be run. I, I, I just want, want your kind of reflection on that, because it, it, didn't, it didn't strike me as an area which is particularly 
challenging in terms of understanding what the climate impact should be. And, and if councils are making a decision on franchises without really understanding what the climate impact is, then that, that would be a bit concerning. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's take everybody who wants to answer that. So start with Claire Wormley. Um, this is where one of the things that's kind of always problematic in terms of carbon reporting comes in. The protocols were not set up around the idea of a public body. They were set up around large industrial sites. So essentially when they're talking about franchises, they don't really actually mean bus franchises for the public sector. They mean a franchise model, which is like McDonald's, for example. Um, when it's very easy to kind of there are some things where it's relatively it would be relatively easy to track those emissions but whether the local authority actually has sufficient control over or influence over those emissions to change them is another matter buses might be one where they do um, which is why when we're doing area-wide reporting which is all the emissions that occur in a territory buses are obviously included because there's obviously an interest in kind of increasing bus um, travel and having it as low carbon as possible. When, generally speaking, the, the, the closer the relationship that you have with a scope three emission, the easier it is for you to, to calculate it. So things, for example, like water consumption, because we actually kind of have water meters, we can usually kind of go, yes, we use this, roughly this amount of water. Scottish water is the only provider in Scotland. We can therefore work out an approximate footprint of that. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about things like, for example, care services, about a quarter of the budget for local authorities goes on social care. Um, and at the moment, the only method that we have for calculating the emissions from that social care is to apply a single spend factor. So the amount of money you spend gets allocated a carbon amount. There are two spend factors for social care, which is about a quarter of the budget in Scotland. And therefore, what we will be doing is potentially bringing in an awful lot of uncertainty and a very large, bulky footprint on top of something that we know quite well. So there are bits, yes, we can calculate them. We can be so quite precise. So you're saying that's, that's impossible to work out the carbon impact of the care sector? It's not impossible, right. but it would but take an awful lot more resources and time than we currently have. Do you think been. it's worth doing? I think it's worth doing when we know how to do it that we don't impose risks on that sector. Right. Okay. I think there is a risk to okay. arbitrarily asking people to provide their carbon footprint. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Jamie? Or Mark, do you want so it's, a, it's a figure that's just allocated on expenditure for, for social care. That's, is, is that what you're saying? At, at the moment, the only method that we have for calculating procured goods and services is essentially we look at the spend and we allocate that spend to categories and we put a carbon number on that category. Some categories are reasonably precise, like agricultural goods, and some categories are very large, like social care. But but social care, for example, in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow, would be totally different to social care in the Highlands. Yes. One, one, you can jump on a bus and get to where you want to go to, and one may you be driving for 35 minutes to get to somebody you need to see. Yes. So is, it doesn't seem quite precise. It seems a bit of a guesstimate at the best. Yes. OK, thank you. Sorry for clarifying yeah. that. Sorry, um, Mark. Mark Roberts, did you want to come in? You're indicating, I think. So what I, I think um, what, what's, what's good about the Scottish Government's improvement plan is when in talking about sort of um, Category 1 Scope 3 emissions, so around procurement and that sort of thing, they're talking about trying to establish a hybrid me methodology that not only looks at, at spend in the way that, that Claire has described, but also looking at su supplier-specific information. So that is a step forward in my interpretation of that in terms of having a more sophisticated methodology. So it is challenging and we recognise the complexity of it. We think it's important, as the improvement plan sets out, that first steps are taken. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think this one through. You mentioned social care. I mean, surely there's opportunities for saving money within this as well, whether it's about, you know, low carbon heating systems or it's about, you know, electric vehicles. Um, so I'm just, I'm just kind of seeing, you know, it, it seems that it's being presented as a problem 
Whereas actually, isn't it a way to deliver more efficiencies within public sector services as well as reduce carbon ultimately? Isn't that why it's worth measuring it? George, I think this one. Very quickly, I, for me, the way that the Scottish Government has clustered these uh, uh, is very useful. Some will move faster than others. So I think your issue around franchises is, is a point in, in, okay. you know, point in case where if we've got the, the year ahead to actually look at the methodologies and get consistency um, and, and figure out what's the methodologies for actually measuring this stuff and how, how far down that sort of chain of influence are we going to go. I think that's what the group two is all about. Some will move faster than others. And I think you're pointing at something, Mark, which is if you've got direct control over a franchise and you're concerned about the, maybe the scope one and scope two emissions and trying to shift it into opportunity rather than threat, then I think we can start, start to move it into a situation where you're using that data and your influence to affect kind of change through the supply chain. So in, in short, I think the, the groupings contain harder and easier things to resolve and some will move faster than others. I think the franchise thing would likely be something that would be easier to resolve than sort of goods and services. Mm -hmm. if not. Okay, anyone else? No? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, Douglas, I think you've got some questions next. Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. Um, in the, gov the Scottish Government's response, it says that uh, mandating the report of procurement emissions at this time could therefore result in unintended negative consequences and driving the wrong type of behaviour and decision maker. Does the panel agree with that comment? Maybe come to Mark first of all. So we, we, we made this recommendation and, and produced the improvement report, um, in part driven from, from the expectation um, which related to the um, interim guidance to, to public bodies dating back to 2021 that scope three emissions should be reported. And we made the recommendation full, in the full knowledge that this was a very complex area and there was going to have to, there would be considerable methodological development that was needed to do it. But it was important that the sort of first steps were taken. So um, as other members of the panel have mentioned, some local authorities have taken some initial steps. We think it is important that those next steps are taken in refining those methodologies. Um, and as George has men mentioned, it's, it seems a very pragmatic way to, to go, go about doing this. Our only concern is, is that there is, is no fixed timescale for when these things will come into place. But we, we do not underestimate the complexities in doing this. But in terms of the negative consequences, what, what, what could they mean there? I think, I think if you later. if you took a very very simplistic approach and, and said oh, um, we are we're spending an awful lot of money on this particular service and that therefore generates um, a huge amounts of emissions um, that could drive decision making in in, um, in a particular particular direction. Um, I would imagine that local authorities have a more sophisticated approach to sort of their, um, how they take into account that type of information before making really significant decisions. Um, so I appreciate the, the theoretical risk, um, whether or not it's actually a real risk, I'm not convinced by. Okay. Uh, Claire, would you like to come in? Um, so I think this probably is kind of related to what I was talking about before about the, the social care issue. I think that at the moment, what we don't really have is the ability to make good decisions about information that is provided to us. So that if we're asking people, for example, for the, the carbon cost of a, a good, which is a simple one, services are harder, then that essentially has to be done with a life cycle analysis. A life cycle analysis report usually costs about £50,000, and it's usually about 60 pages long. Do we know that when we get to the decision making about procurement, that we have the ability to take that information and use that correctly and interpret, interpret correctly. Are we absolutely sure that every player in this market is going to be truthful and honest and upfront? Or are some of them going to go, yes, we've got zero carbon services here by us. And other players who are actually doing the right thing, they're doing slow, effective measures around PV, around insulation and things like that. And people would judge them as not being sufficient. I don't think that we know that we've got the ability to make the decisions on the information that we're going to be asking for. And I think that makes it risky, particularly in a social care situation where we're working with very vulnerable people and quite marginal services. So, yeah, there's risks, I think. Okay. 
George, you, you were nodding at one stage there. Was that because you wanted to come in, or a, a were you just, just generally agree? Just maybe to give a, 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 a practical example. I know I was speaking to a local authority member, and they were talking about actually putting a number against, say, their IT spend, mm -hmm. give them a sense that there is an issue there to be investigated, rather than saying, well, we need to cut how much we're spending on laptops, or we need to sort of look for a completely different supplier. What that allowed them to do is engage in a far more so a robust way with the supplier and it actually ended up in a positive conversation with the IT supplier to say look we've, we're doing a whole range of sort of green activities ourselves we can bring that to to some of your solutions so it's not it's not a perfect fix to say we're going to go to net zero within a, within a short period of time but it empowers the public sector to engage to engage with the private sector and, and probably shift some of the conversation into that space around innovation and opportunity rather than just we've got a number and how, how do we reduce reduce that against the target that we've magicked up uh, and then we've got to measure that to the nth degree moving forward. There's a real desire to sort of focus on how do we use this to empower, uh, empower ourselves to shift, you know, the whole system's going to have to shift towards net zero. So this, I think it empowers local government and the public sector to be more robust in its engagement with, with suppliers without obsessing about that perfect number. But I'm just trying to work out why mandating the reporting of procurement emissions mm. could have a negative impact on behaviours and, mm. and decision making. It's probably the methodology that we're concerned about. Yeah, yeah. and that probably goes into the next question as well. Is, and, you know, obviously, we've got the um, promote, proposed commencement of mandatory reporting and we've got encouragement of voluntary reporting up until that point. And this, I guess, is there use in that? Is this the time now to sort of get that methodology correct and to almost like practice the, 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 the mandatory reporting that we need in the future? On a practical sense, yes. I uh, think okay. a lot of our members would want to know direction of travel and then start to think about what data do, do I need to collect in order to be able to report. And there's a bit of a sort of time lag involved in this, just in terms of if you're going to report on your previous financial year, then you need to be collecting the data in that period in order to report in mm -hmm. the year ahead. So, yeah, I think as much foresight as possible for members would be, better, would be the best. OK, and so, so in terms of the, the, the voluntary reporting, do you think that will have much of an impact on local authorities? Local authorities, sorry, that's a question yes, to me. Right. <laughs> Local authorities need the methodology. It is, I mean, this, this committee has much looked at the capacity within local authorities to, 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 to contribute um, to the national net zero targets and capacity was one of the big things that was sort of like flagged up. So yes, individual authorities are testing some approaches. Um, different local authorities have got different amounts of capacity for all this reporting, but clearly I think what the Scottish Government report indicates that there's three categories of, 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 um, of, of the 17 scope, um, um, of the, sorry, the 15 scope, scope three categories, and um, they need a lot of further development work um, for clear, consistent, reliable um, methodology that actually drives the positive decision-making process. Um, I think that's what's become very clear. And if you're asking about the, you know, the, the, the wrong decisions, the, the example I gave very early on, the, the circular economy bill again, which this committee had deep, deep, deep involvement in, and procurement along circular economy lines is something this is committee definitely wanted to see as part of the bill. Um, the example we're giving here that if procurement, um, purchase goods and services category, one of the scope three would be because the methodology isn't mature enough, but the reporting would be required, would be purely um, reported on spend, then the driver would become to reduce your spend in order to have less scope three emissions, but actually the quality that you're seeking through the circular economy bill um, would become lost and would be de-incentivized. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the voluntary reporting, will all 32 local authorities um, progress with that or will they, will they wait for the methodology, will they wait for the, the mandatory reporting to come into place? You know, will it make an impact and make any, any change whatsoever? Local authorities will always report when they are mandated to report, but I think the, the issue that is being discussed here is 
how much capacity is that going to take up um, in a space where we've got a climate emergency where local authorities have to focus their resources and secondly how good is how good is the data that would be collected in order to drive what we also want is to get closer to the net zero target mm. mark can i so maybe ask you as well in terms of the voluntary reporting do you think that will have make any impact for, for local authorities um, as as i mentioned in response to an earlier question so there's been voluntary reporting of scope three emissions um, for some time now and the 2021 guidance says that scope three emissions should be reported and uh, as we've we've heard and as we reported in our improvement report there are only um, a very small number of local authorities that have chosen to to do so so far um, that does reflect as as all members of the panel have have said i think the the complexities associated with the method methodologies but I'll, I'll return to my um, previous point that it's really important to make a start so understanding kind of the, the the wider impact of procurement decisions for example is really really significant and as George has described it, it can also enable a, a more sophisticated conversation with suppliers in terms of um, their contribution to, to emissions as, as well so we think it would based on past experience is not likely to to drive um, an increase in reporting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Camino. Thanks very much, uh, Douglas. Now, Monica, you've got some questions on me. Thank you, convener, and good morning to our panel. Um, so we've just been talking about some of the capacity issues. Um, I note that in the improvement plan, the Scottish Government highlights that local authorities have increasingly stretched resources and adhering to the reporting of Scope 3 emissions will result in additional reporting and possibly additional training of staff. Um, so I just wonder, maybe starting with, with you, Silky, um, do we know how much additional resource and training will be required to deliver mandatory reporting and to do it to a, a good standard? Um, thank you for this question. Um, no, because <laughs> um, we, we, can, so we can at this very, at this point in time, not quantify what the actual resource would be required, because as we've seen in the Scottish Government's report, there isn't even a methodology yet. So if there isn't, I mean, for, you know, for some of the, for some of the um, um, 15 scope three categories, so what Scottish Government here lay, has laid out as, you know, these three groups, which have got different levels of advancement of methodology, clearly where there isn't a clear methodology yet um, we don't even know how long that piece of string is what people would need to be trained for so no we, we, we can't put a figure on it but clearly it will be a significant resource um, you know um, it, 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 it will require additional capacity and I think what's important in this context and then this is kind of like very much what was put forward in our in our earlier position in December 2023 is that Local authorities are keen to use data in the most effective way to actually drive their decision making, to, to find the biggest intervention, to find where we can, you know, drive down emissions the most. And this is why the um, Scottish Climate Intelligence Service was... Um, <clears throat> Was, 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 was brought into life. Um, and I think it's important in, 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 in this context that the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service and Claire can explain that much better than I can. It's very much looking at the data that local authorities can influence and the big data sets, the local, you know, the, the, the area emissions. And they might in, in, in some areas overlap with some of the scope three, but they, they are not the same as scope three and they are not um, um, and they're not all included. So in terms of capacity, yes, there is stretched capacity. And in the, in the world of limited resources and very tight local government budgets, what the 32 local authorities decided is to focus, um, the, the, to focus their resources on the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service because it was felt that that's where capacity, that, that is there to, 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 to collect data can best actually inform decisions and can bring the biggest benefits. And I don't know whether the figures are right, so like differences between, you know, 30% of greenhouse gas emissions influence compared to scope three, which 
is around three or four or something like this. So that the capacity is absolutely crucial in there, yes. Okay, so I'm hearing significant resource will be required, but we just can't quantify that at yeah. the moment. And I'm assuming we don't know how much of that will be recurring um, funding that would be required and how much of that would be a sort of a one-off investment. I don't know, then, Claire, is that a good point to bring you in to, to perhaps add to what Silky said? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of we've done this for a couple of local authorities, I think it's fair to say that most local authorities do actually report some scope three emissions. Um, it's just that they tend to be on the business travel and water waste end of things, um, which are, you know, traditionally what people have reported and also fairly straightforward and they hold fairly good levers over. Um, there's kind of like the new category of homeworking and commuting, which people have started to report, but they're kind of, again, the figures are pretty senseless and there's not a huge amount of influence that local authorities have over those and therefore we have to kind of work out whether that's worth doing. The, when we've worked with local authorities to look at their procurement footprint, um, usually local authorities are engaging with about, you know, odds, usually about a thousand suppliers a year. Um, and it's usually relatively easy to get information about which suppliers they've spent money on, but what they've actually procured from those suppliers is a very different matter. So that's actually the, a lot of the resources that would be required to do the Category 1 and Category 2 are, set, are, are in slightly different parts of the council. So it's not just a, a kind of an increase of the reporting officers in terms of climate change. It's actually an increase of skills or, across different areas within the council. Um, and as Silky says, there's... There's differences between what we call, so what scope three emissions, which are the kind of like the indirect emissions of the organisation, and the area wide emissions, which are the territorial emissions of the council area. Um, they do overlap um, in some areas. So when we work in area wide emissions, so for example, um, supporting businesses and households to reduce their footprint. Um, then that will often have an imp impact on scope three emissions. Um, we don't know what that impact will be precisely, but we know it will occur. There will also be emissions that are scope three that occur outside of Scotland's boundaries um, that we'll have very little ability to track and, and see whether we're actually having any effect on. Okay. Monica, sorry, can we, can we bring Mark in to of find course. out if he acknowledges the, the problems that Silky suggested? Sorry, I, sorry, Monica. Thank you. We, we absolutely do recognise the, the, that this will be um, an additional demand. So um, it's without, without question that, that sort of this is, would be something over and above um, local authority, authorities' current reporting requirements. Um, we, it's not within our remit um, or, or for us really to kind of try and quantify what, what that additional resource ought, ought to be. We were really making the ob observation in terms of here was, appears to be a gap in the way in which um, guidance was, was being implemented. Um, again, going back to my previous point, we acknowledge how complex this is going to be, but it's important to make a start. And the action that is, is described in the imp improvement plan we think is very positive. Um, what we're concerned about is the, the kind of open-ended nature of that commitment. So we're looking for some kind of commitment in terms of when is this actually going to happen. So, sorry, Monica, thank you. No, that, that's okay. Um, I mean, is there a risk that this just becomes a tick box exercise? Because we've heard that there's obviously training needs, um, methodology underdeveloped. So, you know, we could have local authorities gathering lots of data and then it doesn't really make much change on, on the ground. So how do we um, minimise the risk of it becoming a tick box exercise, particularly in the early years? So other, others may want to come in, but I'll, I'll, I'll start. I think George has described quite a good example where kind of being forced to think about kind of what are the, the indirect emissions associated with other parts of, of your, the supply chain, which are providing to a lo local authority, allows you to have, have a, a more compl complex conversation with them about what are they doing to reduce their emissions in terms of their provision <coughs> of services to a local authority. So I think that that sort of um, discussion is very, very helpful and, and sits underneath the reporting of emissions. So I, I think um, 
I think that is quite a powerful tool to try and sort of have a broader conversation about how do we kind of influence um, others outside of the public sector potentially to reduce their emissions in the same way. Do you share that optimistic view, yeah. George? So, just in terms of being sort of pragmatic, as our members want to be and reasonable, we probably need to shift some of this conversation into the space of kind of co-development between the practitioners and the decision makers. So, there is the likes of the climate delivery framework being put together at the political level. There's, this poses a lot of questions in terms of what capacity is there within local government and what's the best way to meet those capacity needs. So, the issue in terms of how much and how much is it going to cost? I think it's just a bit of an open-ended question at the moment. What we do have is experience within the local government community, within SSN, to have sensible conversations about what's the best way to tackle this. So, as an example, some local authorities have spent money on consultants to provide a top-level spend analysis, so they know how much that costs and what they get for that expenditure. We've got Climate Intelligence Service as a collective approach to quite a major challenge. So the local authorities have come together to say we want to build capacity, but we're not going to do it 32 times you know, uh, separately. We're going to combine our efforts. Um, and I think we just need to go through some of that mm. deliberation on this process. Mm. I would expect that to be part of the how do we tackle this over the course. You know, there's the methodology side of things, but what is sufficient? You, know, you can work on averages, you can get into you know, specifics. And it's, I think we need to work with decision makers and practitioners mm -hmm. to say, how do we get the sweet spot in terms mm -hmm. of tackling the problem okay. and making sure that we've got the capacity to, to do something with the data? I think okay. you're alluding to the fact that it's no use measuring something if you've got no capacity left to then take action. And that would be an overall concern. OK, thank you. I think just to bring it back, because that's why I'm interested in, you know, what resource will actually be required, because I, I hear that, you know, some local authorities, for example, are, are using external consultants, but that can be quite expensive. Um, so I just wonder then in terms of, you know, being certain or confident that we're getting good value for taxpayers' money as well, you know, would it not be reasonable that we, we start to put some figures on this and work out what do we actually need to do this properly and do it well? So I don't know if anyone wants to give a final thought on that before I come to Jamie. I'll come yes, in okay. on that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think this is, this is, this is what the position we put forward in terms of proportionality, you know, we need to be clear how much capacity would be, you know, how much additional capacity would be required. But as we say, we haven't even got the methodology, so we can't, we can't answer that question at the moment. It's, it's how long is a piece of string. Um, but yes, looking at the additional resources um, and the impact that that action would have. Mm -hmm. And I think what is important here is that the reason why the 32 local authorities decided to invest significant money into the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service because the area-based emissions account for such a large part of impact. Um, you know, the kind of like 33% I mentioned earlier compared to, um, you know, a, a lot of the scope three emissions really trailing down in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 the overall proportion of the greenhouse gas inventory um, around a few percent. So I think, yes, resources required, impact on the, on the greenhouse gas um, overall budget, and then the actual ability of local authorities to influence these, because there's no point that we gather a lot of data on things we can't influence. Sure. Um, I think Jamie wanted to come in, and I'll come to George. Thanks very much. Um, just, to, just to follow up on your point about you know avoiding this being becoming a tick box mm -hmm. exercise, and that's something that we were very, very aware uh, when we were doing the investigation, and it's essentially why we recommended for an independent monitoring body, so that that actually doesn't happen. Um, and just in terms of resources, we are aware that this will require probably a step change once the methodologies are sorted. But in essence, the recommendations that were made were all designed to assist local authorities and provide them with the resources to an extent in terms of how they can then go about doing this stuff. And that was the feedback that we heard from climate change practitioners during our investigation. So in that connection, we have enhanced statutory guidance that will be helpful to local authorities. We have climate change, a climate plan mandates and templates, mm -hmm. which will help. We have the methodologies that are going to be coming, th be coming online, hopefully sooner rather than later. And then we have the monitoring body that's there to help as well. 
That is helpful. Thank you, Jimmy. George. I would say one of the benefits we have got, or one of the assets that we have got, is we are very well networked in this space. So the SSN itself could play into the process of saying, what is the best way to tackle this? So how do we make sure that we are doing it in the most cost-effective way? Uh, and Mark alluded to this in the sense that some of this could lead to preventative spend. So if you measure it to, to a point, you can then maybe get involved in the process of actually you could drive some savings through actually managing your, your supply chain or, or your, your waste or your commuting mm -hmm. and the like. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, action four in the improvement plan addresses the development and implementation of a training programme on emissions reporting for local authority officers. Um, is this something which the new climate intelligence service could play a role in supporting? Um, we are currently running a training programme, but it's specifically around the use of the area-wide inventory data set and developing interventions, so around area-wide climate action plans. Um, as I said, there's obviously a kind of an intersect between scope three emissions from local authorities and area-wide emissions. They, they definitely intersect with each other. Um, and therefore, actions that local authorities take on their area-wide footprint will also have likely an impact on their scope three footprint. We won't see it, but we will know it's there hopefully. Um, but in terms of the, this is a quite a different flavour of footprint. So area-wide footprints are essentially territorial footprints, multi-stakeholder um, and based on a relationship with an area, whereas organisational footprints are based on the relationship with the reporting entity. So really the two things aren't exactly the same and the methodologies aren't exactly the same. For the Scottish Tide Climate Intelligence Service, we will be providing local authorities with a data set that they use. What we want to do is for them to concentrate on the actions and inter interventions that they need to take across the levers and influence they have, rather than thinking about too much about the, the data, which is relatively straightforward for area-wide emissions. It's much easier data set. So probably not is the answer. <laughs> no, thank you, um, Claire. Um, I'm just looking at the 2023 report into climate change training in Scottish local government by the Improvement Service. It found that local authority workers highlighted a few different areas for the Scottish Government in terms of assistance for training related to climate change, and that included produce national standardised training and guidance, promote and develop mechanisms and forums for collaboration and discussion, um, provide guidance outlining um, colleagues, organisations, modes of delivery that can be consulted to support with co-delivery of training provision uh, in regards to climate change, quite a long list, and greater communication between local climate departments, if they exist, and national and local climate campaigns. So just any thoughts on, on that? From anyone. If you all look away, then, <laughs> then Monica's going to have to uh, nominate somebody. Well done, George. You put your hand up very quickly. Fair recommendations. <laughs> we need capacity in the training space, to put it simply. I think we, we you know, we, we operate on annualised budgets, so that's a challenge, and limited budgets in terms really getting into the training space. I think we do a lot around capacity building in the general sense, you know, sharing good practice, bringing members together, dialogues, conferences, case studies, etc. But to really dig into the training space is, is will mm -hmm. take a sort of step change in mm -hmm. terms of capacity to deliver that. Can I maybe just pick up on the points you raised about you know, sharing good practice and training yeah. and, and so on? Because we hear a lot in this committee about the importance of mm -hmm. collaboration on the, the road to net zero. But we also hear sometimes <laughs> that collaboration is a bit that we need to do better at, and that's often linked back to capacity, people not having the time. So we hear a lot about some really good practice, but we get pockets of that around the country. It's not always scaled up. Um, so are we really doing enough around that, that sharing, um, or is there a real capacity issue? I think, I think there are capacity issues there in terms of the, you know, the scale of the challenge in comparison to the, the resources going in. I think, I think most stakeholders would say there is there's a, a shift to be made there. Um, I think we work very efficiently with the resources that we've got. A lot of the capacity that we have is in the fact that it's a network. 
So yeah. the, the implications of layering more responsibility on some of our members may actually have a capacity issue in the sense that they will have less time to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, and you're always in that space of actually getting the collaboration to be robust and sustainable in itself. Yeah. Rather, I, I take your point in terms of trying to get away from it being a, a useful conversation into something that's really driving change. Mm -hmm. And Silky, just on that, again, just to get us a final view from, from local government on that, I mean, how... How do you free up capacity uh, across local government to work with a whole range of partners? Yeah, I think capacity just is a challenge. And, you know, going, going back to the report, your own committee, mm -hmm. um, this committee here produced um, on, on, on the whole investigation. Yes, absolutely. It's, you know, local authorities have set themselves targets. They are putting resources staff resources, financial resources behind it, and capacity is always a challenge. And that's why it's so important to use your capacity and focus on the most important things. Um, so um, that, that, that also plays into, into, into something, you know, we need capacity for delivery as well as capacity for monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, 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 in, in, in simple words, we, we, we must avoid that we have sort of like a gold-plated monitoring system and then no capacity left to actually deliver on, 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 on the things that we have found. Capacity is always a big challenge and the general financial position of local government is, is, has been well communicated. <laughs> Mm -hmm. okay. Generally, not well, it's today. good to get all of that on the record. So, thank you very much. I'll hand back to the convener. Thank you very much. I'm just looking around to see if there's any other questions. Mark, you'd like to come in? Yeah, can I just come back briefly to that that third group of scope three emissions? So, the the emissions that are that are hard to measure, um, councils don't measure at, at, at the moment. And there's a question mark about whether you think it's worth going forward to measure them or, or not in the future. Um, I mean, I suppose simplistically, it looks like it's worth measuring in order to create leverage on, say, you know, procurement contracts and, and other areas. But if, if you don't measure and you don't have a figure for what that, you know, catering franchise is delivering or, you know, how the social care sector that you're, um, you're engaging with is going to reduce its emissions or indeed the bus franchise is going to reduce its emissions, what, what are the levers? Um, you know, in, in terms of, of, of those contractual obligations and those negotiations. I mean, it, it's public procurement so far advanced that actually it doesn't matter, you don't need to measure this stuff because it's built into the, to the procurement process and it will always, you know, deliver a reduction in carbon emissions. Or are, are we actually trying to use the reporting here as a way to kind of strengthen what is inherently a weak public procurement system? within local government. Silke, yeah. I would say, and Claire and others can probably come in on that, the levers lie with the area-based reporting system because that has got the strongest... The, 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 those data which are being collated through the area-based reporting through the Scottish Climate Intelligence mm -hmm. Service offer the strongest lever. Um, so I don't think anybody would say all these Scope 3 emissions don't matter, but... Um, the strongest levers are lie with those part of the scope three emissions and others that are collated through the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service. So yes, local authorities, their bus franchises, everything they do, if it's an important lever, if it's, if, if it's a significant spend, um, if it is something that offers the opportunity for carbon reduction, is being considered as part of... Yeah, but do, do you not see a difference, though, between, like a public contract where there's public money going into, say, a catering service in schools, and then what happens next door in McDonald's? You know, what happens next door in McDonald's is wrapped up in area-based reporting, and it's what happens within the general council area. But there's a direct link in terms of the public spend that councils, our taxpayers' money, is going into supporting public services. Should there not be more of a kind of climate carbon accounting within that? That's what I'm trying to understand. Why, yeah. what, why, why this is, is it's fine to sort of push it off limits a bit and say, well, it's a bit too hard. You know, there are difficult decisions to make here, and it's all captured by the general carbon reduction within a council area. It, does, it doesn't, doesn't feel quite right to me. I don't think we would want to say that all the scope three is just too difficult. Let's not do it. 
I think um, what we do know is that for for a number of the categories, the one in the first group, sort of like, you know, a majority of local authorities report against, where they feel they're significant and, and, and local authorities can have impact with the remaining categories. I think every every sustainability officer and every council is keen and and, and, and to, to, to see where the methodology development in this one goes. That's beyond, um, you know, the technical scope of one local authority. So, I mean, that, that, that's a development in the academic and, and, and public sector that, that, that needs to mature and develop. Um, but going back to, um, you know, large expenditure that a local authority incurs, be it through, you know, bus franchises or, you know, health and social care spend, whatever it is, um, as part of the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service and as part of the climate, de uh, the climate delivery framework, which is going to come forward, exactly um, what local authorities want to do is look at these big um, parts of expenditure where there is opportunities for leverage, for levering in carbon reduction. Um, and that isn't necessarily solved by catching every single one of your last scope three emissions. That's looking at the big areas, the big mm -hmm. impact, the big spend, where a local authority can actually leave a change. And the desire that sits behind the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service is to get to grips with these big parts where you can have an impact. Okay. Um, so no, yep. it's not too difficult to do, can't be bothered. It's we really want to get our teeth into the most difficult bits where we can do something substantial. Okay, I think George and Claire definitely wanted to come in. Yeah. George, if I could ask you to be brief, that would be helpful. Uh, I, mean, I think just on that question of, you know, catering is a good example. The difficulty of this is, if we go to catering firms and say, tell us the carbon footprint of the service you're offering, the catering firm then has to, dis has to basically measure that themselves. So they have to then go mm -hmm. to all 36 of their suppliers and say, can you give me the carbon footprint of your potatoes? The next person down then has to go and ask the next person down, next person down. They then have to collate all of this information mm -hmm. up into a number for you and then provide that number to you. And then we make a judgment. But we don't have the ability to know whether those firms are doing that chasing down the line effectively and correctly according to the methodology. We just have to accept the number they give us. And those numbers usually, my experience with doing product footprints is that the error bar on them is about 50%. However good you get the methodology, there is a huge amount of error in these footprints because we're chasing data down to unknown, unknown and unknowable quantities. So essentially we're then making judgments and saying we'll take this company because it's got a lower carbon footprint than this company. But we don't know if that's really true. It could be that they're very good at hiding their carbon footprint. It could be that they're quite good at cutting off the tails and going with that bit doesn't matter. We don't know. Or it might be that this firm has got really good potatoes, but this firm's got better tomatoes. And I just don't think at the moment that we've got the ability to make those kinds of decisions. And therefore, by asking for that information, and, you know, a catering firm might be able to do this, but some small businesses, you know, if we're looking to kind of promote small businesses in Scotland, that's a huge ask sometimes in terms of data. Mm. But presumably there is a conversation, say, about local procurement. So, you know, we see in the press quite often, um, you know, councils being challenged about why they're, you know, air freighting chicken from Thailand or whatever. And there's an active conversation about local procurement of ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I, I understand the challenge there of going down to the nth degree. Um, but, but surely there, my point here is that surely there is something around procurement. It might be that the air freighted chickens the are lower carbon. It's possible. Yeah, well, it's yeah, totally yeah. possible in well, terms of... Like because a lot of I'd like to see the data on that. So well, yeah, I, I, yeah exactly. And then, <laughs> then it's kind of like, right, you can do that, but it's a difficult... You, you then have to do an awful lot of auditing and chasing and verifying to make sure that you're being presented with something that's accurate. I'm sure there's plenty of firms who could present to you saying it's kind of like our air freighted chicken, lowest carbon you can imagine. Um, yeah, OK. It sounds like, Claire, you're talking to yourself into producing a 60-page report on the carbon footprint of imported chicken, but maybe not. George, you, not you suggested you were happy. Yeah. Um, I think, Bob, you've got a question you want to... to a final question. And it, is fine, it is final, and, it, and it, it is brief as well. I, I, would, 
Partly the reason why I'm afraid to Google things to better understand this as I'm listening to it, because I'm learning as I go along, convener. Um, so clearly, a complex and emerging methodology. This is not an exact science. It's an iterative process. The uh, local authorities has to be proportionate. But really, what we do is embedded practice across all supply chains everywhere within the agreed international methodology, quite clearly. And I'm conscious, as we went for ESS, that the European Union is seeking to move to scope three reporting, I think, from next year, and at least some companies above a certain scale. Is there an opportunity for public bodies, not just local authorities in Scotland, but you know, across the UK and beyond, for aligning at a European level in relation to some of this stuff, so that when local authorities seek to go to supply chains that are actually international for European-based companies, that alignment is there and there is an integrity to the data. Has any of this been looked at or is it completely tangential to this whole discussion? Uh, Mr Roberts? Maybe a question that you want to raise with, with the Scottish Government in terms of how they're thinking about kind of the, the approach to developing the methodologies. Um, I think what we've, what we've heard and what we have recognised throughout this is this is complex and it is challenging. It is very much an emerging area, but it is important to take the first steps in, in doing this um, in, in order to, to better understand the wider kind of um, impacts of local authorities' activities. Um, we're not underestimating how difficult that it, that this is, but given the significance of the, the, the wider move towards um, achieving net, net zero, we think it's important it's taken, and we think the improvement plan, as, as written, is, is a positive step in the right direction. Okay. Um, final question. You know, you've asked me to be brief, and Silke, it might be one for yourself, but I'm conscious there are large public authorities right across Europe who will be grasping with scope three reporting requirements and supply chains at a European level? Is this something that COSL and local authorities look at, just to share best practice, convener, and, and how to do this? If you don't have any information, that's absolutely fine. If there's information that's maybe at the back of your head, you can perhaps contact the committee uh, after this morning's meeting and, and give us more information. But is that European alignment and embedding best practice, I suppose, proportionately? Um, happy to, 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 to kind of like look look whether there's anything of particular relevance. I mean, COSLA has got a Brussels office. We work very closely with the Committee of European Municipalities and Regions. Um, and wherever there's good practice in any local authority um, association in, 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 our, in, our sister, in our sister associations in, in other European countries, um, there is a communication. And should there be, you know, fantastic models um, you know, or, or, or good approaches, that, that can always be shared. Um, okay. That's helpful. They'll be struggling with the same things that local authorities in Scotland are struggling with. It's just yeah. that makes sure the communication is there. Thank you very much. Can you know? Thanks very much. And just before I thank the panel uh, for the evidence they've given this morning, I just wondered if Douglas Lumsden and Jackie Dunbar wanted to say anything about their previous roles in life in the form of a declaration of interest. You indicated you both might. Yeah, just to remind um, everyone of my uh, register of interest, which shows I was a local councillor at the start of this session. Thank you. It was exactly the same. I don't know if I need to repeat what Douglas said, but thank in the same, same council as well. Thank, thank you very much, and thanks for putting that on the record. Thank you very much to the panel uh, this morning for, for giving uh, evidence to us and helping us with our deliberations. And we will be hearing from the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, next. So um, I am going to uh, briefly suspend the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back. Um, we move to our second panel this morning on Environmental Standards Scotland's Improvement Report and Scottish Government's Improvement Plan. I welcome to the meeting Gillian Martin, the Acting Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and Energy, and her supporting officials, uh, Philip Raines, who is the Deputy Director of Domestic Climate Change, and Andrew Mortimer, who is a statistician and climate change statistics and modelling for the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, I think you're going to make a brief opening statement before we move into questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. It's just to, uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss the improvement plan that we laid on the 3rd of September. Um, we welcome the Environmental uh, Standards Scotland report on the support for local authorities delivering their climate change duties. Uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, uh, local authorities have an absolutely critical role in playing uh, to play in tackling the climate emergency. Um, the recommendations were thoughtful. Um, we have worked constructively with ESS since they, they made them and we've re resolved the majority of them. One area, though, that we haven't been able to accept in full, uh, as the committee knows, uh, is the pathway proposed in response to the recommendation to make the reporting of Scope 3 emissions mandatory for local authorities. And that's set out in the plan that we laid, there are technical and resource challenges with reporting all categories of Scope 3 emissions, and I recognise that Scope 3 emissions account for a significant proportion of local authorities' emissions. So I hope that the committee agrees that the improvement plan sets out a phased and proportionate approach that will help improve the information available to support local decision-making on reducing emissions, uh, but avoids placing uh, an unreasonable uh, additional reporting burden um, on local authorities, one that, that might not actually drive, drive action. Uh, I'd like to thank COSLA and the local authority offices for the valuable input in uh, developing this improvement plan. Um, our reporting duty has helped drive climate action, enables the tracking of progress across the public sector, and the actions set out in the improvement plan seek to enhance the reporting by local authorities, help support the acceleration of the action, but as I say, not uh, uh, give an undue burden to them. Thanks, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And there are a series of questions, and um, I'll get the first one, the easy one for you, Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, what are the pen potential benefits and the potential challenges from local authorities reporting their Scope 3 uh, emissions? Well, you say that's an easy question. It's actually quite a complicated answer um, because there are obvious benefits of having reporting for any kind of like you know emissions um, and in scope three emissions as well. Like scope three emissions could count for about you know. Uh, you know, 70 per cent of the, the, the work that, that services uh, do. Um, so I suppose the, the benefit of, of a system being put in place where we're actually putting in the monitoring and, and measuring of them could allow local authorities to make more informed decisions about, for example, what they procure. You know, um, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it would have to be done in a way that they were not... Um, measuring absolutely everything to the nth degree um, and taking away from the actions that's required and the capacity required to actually deliver on those actions as well. But I was really struck by one of some of the comments of your earlier panel about the conversations that even just talking about reporting in scope three emissions have actually engendered with their, their supply chain, you know, and actually talking to the people that they've been working with for many years about their carbon footprint and what they're doing. So I, I think it could have a positive domino effect in that regard. And I think even the fact that we're, I mean, obviously local authorities are big, one of the biggest procurers in, in, any, in any country. Um, that if you have governments and parliaments starting to talk about the, the measuring of scope three emissions, then even just having that conversation at the moment is probably making suppliers think about, well, how do we measure our, our emissions? What can we report on? What can we say when we're actually going into a you know, bid for the contract on what we're actually doing to reduce our carbon footprint that might make us more attractive to get in, uh, you know, if local authorities are, are looking at their scope three emissions, then maybe suppliers will start looking at, at their carbon footprint and actually putting that in as they're bidding for contracts. So it, should, it could have a real big domino effect. I'm only smiling, Cabinet Secretary, because we heard reports of uh, carbon footprint uh, plans, or, uh, which could be 60 pages long. It might make a tender process quite long, but I yeah. think the resourcing and everything is going to be asked by a 
another committee member. So uh, I'm going to move to Douglas uh, with your questions. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so the plan states that mandating the reporting of procurement emissions at this time could result in unintended negative consequences and driving the wrong type of behaviour and decision making. Can you expand on what you mean by by that and some of the negative things that yes, can happen. Yes, and I think that's actually the biggest... There, there's, two, there's two big concerns that I have around this. One is that, and the other is the capacity that local authorities might have to actually measure Scope 3 emissions, given the, you know, the expertise that's required, given the complexity of what's involved. But the other one that you mentioned about the unintended consequences, I think arises out of the current situation, which I think has been well rehearsed in your previous panel, of the absence of not having a standardised, tested, uh, accurate solution to how to measure uh, and report. And if you don't have an accurate measurement of things, and I think that we, we, we heard from the, 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 the Climate Improvement Service in particular, you, you might be making decisions based on, on data that's come back to you, for example, from a supplier that you can't verify. Yeah? Or that um, you know who's who's um, who's checking up the, the, the information that you're getting back from this sort of like chain of of, of uh, you know reporting back to you, so you're making these calculations is verifiable and is correct. So I think it currently the I think that the fact that the the current approach is reporting on procurement emissions relying on this spend-based method um, and that, that, that sort of like conversion factor that I think some of your panel and, and the, the other panel mentioned. It's just an estimate of the emissions associated with the total spend. So you could, um, you, you could reduce your emissions by reducing what you procure. You know? So the less spend on something would correlate to but what would be the unintended consequences of that? You need, you need to actually procure those items in order for our service to keep going. Um, so you could have an apparent reduction in emissions by buying, procuring lower quality items because they maybe have a less emissions as associated with them. But what's going to be the impact of that on your services? Lower quality products, they might actually need to be renewed more. So, for example, um, and I, I guess it maybe could put off an investment if it's the, the current system. It could put off investment in more energy efficient and more expensive items that might actually be more energy efficient and maybe last longer. So they've got a longer term impact as well. So I think a solely spend based approach is not going to be suitable for use on an ongoing basis. So I think in order to really, I suppose, um, prevent a situation where we might have these unintended consequences, uh, uh, negative consequences and drive maybe the wrong type of behaviour, the methodology has to be worked on, has to be researched. The Scottish Government are involved in the putting forward a focus group as a result of the improvement plan in order to bottom out what the methodology should be so that some of these unintended consequences with the current system of doing this and obviously the capacity issues is bottomed out. I think also just a, one thing I would say is that if there was a model out there that was being used by other countries that we think, well, we can replicate that and bring it over here. We'd do it. But at the moment, this is a conversation, I think, that's happening across a whole lot of uh, countries. And indeed, in the UK, the other countries in the UK have not got a methodology or have not asked for their local authorities to report and scope the emissions. But the fact that we're having this conversation is going to drive the action to get to the place and I think it's still worthwhile doing because there are certain scope three emissions that's going to be easier to report on than others, which will drive action. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about methodology, are, are, we, are we just talking about local authorities here? Or, you know, you rightly were talking about the supply chain earlier and how, yeah. um, you know, surely they need to have a, a common methodology as, as well. Because we heard in the, uh, the last panel that, you know, you may be judging two suppliers, one says, oh, I'm doing really great in my, um, mm -hmm. um, my, my, my scope three emissions. The other one says, well, I'm, I'm not doing that, that good. But if they're, if they're not being judged the correct way, you mm -hmm. may be making decisions. Or they don't know 
or they don't know. And I was really struck what was, what was said in the last panel about if you go far enough down the supply chain, you might have quite small businesses. Now, if you've got a small business of under, you know, 50 people and you're providing goods and you're procured by, by a local authority, or you're providing goods to the person who is procured directly by a local authority, you, won't, you first of all, wouldn't have the capacity to be, perhaps, to actually accurately talk about your emissions. But also, would you, would you have the, a person who had the expertise within your company? You know, so I think that there has to be um, you know, proportionality around this, because you know, we're, we're a country of small to medium-sized enterprises, and what we don't want to do is have a situation, and the, the convener actually referred to it in his response to my earlier question, you know, a 60-page report by a company in order to be able to actually bid for a local authority contract I might, on, on, on this one issue, that might be too much. That might be too much of a burden to be putting on those people as well. So I think, I think my, my point that I always come back to this in, what are we doing to drive action? And that's why we were able to actually say, in response to the, the Environmental uh, Standards um, Scotland, that we were able to agree on four actions straight away that would drive action. But this one was, is trickier because just reporting on scope three emissions wouldn't necessarily prompt action and it could actually tie up local authorities in doing an awful lot of work on reporting and monitoring these emissions which actually might take away from the efforts or might lead them, as, as, as you've identified, um, to maybe making uh, decisions based on potentially inaccurate uh, data. Mm -hmm. So is there a danger that the methodology might actually um, I would say, say harm, harm the smaller suppliers in, the, in that chain? Because not they, the, they not the methodology is, is worked through. I mean, I think they're actually at the point where, you know, we've got a focus group um, that is, is going to be put together with all the experts in the field and also working with, with local authorities on what's required. And then there's going to be, we're, we're going to have to commission larger pieces of research on this in order to inform what happens as this methodology is, is, is put together. And obviously, at the moment, we've got um, uh, our, our colleagues in uh, sorry, uh, Climate Improvement Scotland. Yeah? Uh, Improvement Scotland. Imp yes, Improvement yeah. Scotland, who are in the kind of intervening period working with local authorities and actually providing them with the methodology of all the other things that they're going to have to do in order to redu reduce emissions in the short and medium term. But on the scope three emissions, I think as you heard from the panel, it's so much more complex. And how far do you go down that chain? Um, and what, what consequences could there be? Uh, and I think that your panel, I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was watching it, um, it from my office and there was nothing I disagreed with mm -hmm. in anything that they said. So that's why the methodology has to be bottomed out and that's going to be a substantial piece of work. Yeah. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, so obviously we've got the mandatory reporting that will come in the future. So do you think the, in terms of the voluntary reporting, do you think that will have an impact on the actions of Scottish local authorities? There's a few local authorities that are already reporting voluntarily on it. I think, I'm, I'm trying to remember, there was um, one particular, it was East Renfrewshire Council actually did a piece of work. Um, uh, they published their supply chain's uh, emissions data. Um, but they reported back that they actually found it very difficult um, to actually report um, accurately on that and how it would actually, uh, how it would actually impact on their decision making. I think what we've got to remember I, you know, I, can't, I can't believe I'm telling this to a, a former councillor, but you've got to remember the, the variety and the breadth of services that a local authority does procure and the amount of different sizes of organisations that are bidding in for contracts and, uh, and, and supplying goods and services. Um, so it could be quite difficult to ascertain what the scope three emissions is for the reasons that we've all talked about. You know, some are larger, some have got the data, some don't have the data. Can you rely on the data? But I think, I come back to what I said at the beginning, the very fact that we are, that the ESS put out their report 
that this conversation is happening and the improvement plans, plans in place, that the Scottish Government is working with COSLA, and we're, uh, we've held a, a few workshops with local authorities where we've actually started to talk about what this could actually mean for, the, for their activities in terms of identifying Scope 3 emissions. There will be things that have come out of that which have prompted action in some areas. Um, and I think that, um, again, members of your panel mentioned those conversations that have been had with suppliers. The larger suppliers may have that, mm. that data readily available or may say, well, actually, we are moving in this direction for the reasons of reducing our emissions. Can we give you some information on that? So I, I think that the voluntary uh, reporting, I think, will there be actual time spent on voluntary reports going back, I think that the local authorities will make that judgment on whether that's the best use of their, or their time. Um, but before we put mandatory reporting in place, we have to have methodology bottomed out that the local authorities are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So 32 local authorities just now, you mentioned East Ren. How many others are reporting voluntar voluntarily on, on Scope it's a, 3? It's a very small amount, Phil. I mean, uh, Phil might be able to help me, but East it, Renfrewshire was the one that I was... Um, mm. and, and they, as I said, they, they, they came back and said, we've done this exercise, but we don't know... We, we, we don't know how... how much it's going to influence, or it can influence, what we're actually doing. Phil might have more uh, information. I don't have a list. Mm -hmm. Put simply, um, as you know, Stage three um, um, emissions, a lot of different categories. So some categories, most, I mean, I would say the bulk of local authorities report on some of those categories using the spend-based methodology, particularly around purchase goods and services. Others in that in those those emissions categories um, are just too difficult, and very very few do. So it depends what kind of emissions you're talking about. So it's, a, so it's a complete mix, I guess. It's a complete it? mix. I've actually, yeah. got, I've actually got a list. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh. I was just sort of like, um, in, in terms of, um, I just realised I had this in front of me. In category one, 9%, uh, that's purchase goods and services, 9% reported, of, of local authorities reported some emissions. Category five, which is waste, 94% mm -hmm. reported. Category six, which was business travel, 91 reported. And category seven, employee commuting, 13%, home working, it was 72. So you see, these, these are the categories where it's easier to have that data. Um, and they're, they're, they're reporting back on So that. how are you going to encourage more local authorities to, to report on the, 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 the trickier you, ones? And then you'll learn lessons, I yeah. imagine, to, to have do, the methodology. Do you know, do you know what I feel, I feel is far more important than the actual reporting on the difficult stuff is the climate change plans that the, the local authorities are going to be, be putting in place and the work they're doing with the Climate Improvement Service in order to drive action. We could... We could say, well, we want you to report on the really difficult stuff without any kind of methodology being worked through. I don't see what, what, what gain there is there. But if they're, if they're doing well in reporting on quite a lot of the, the categories, then obviously we can be assisting them and looking at the methodology to improve th that reporting. They can be looking at the actions that they're taking and putting, and putting into a climate change plan. I'm, I mean, local authorities, as I said in my opening statement, have got massive... Um, opportunity and uh, importance in terms of reducing emissions. It's the action that they're going to take that I'm most interested in. And I think it would be the action that they're going to take uh, that, that I think wider society would be most interested in. Um, rather than, well, hang on a second, they're only reporting on, they're only giving us figures on some of the easier to, to measure scope three reporting, we must we must compel them to report on all of them. That might actually be quite difficult. And what would that what might that yield in terms of action? And I think we've got to be proportionate about what we what we put in. Which is why we didn't automatically agree with that recommendation. We needed to do further work around but, this. But is it not a case if you're not measuring it, you can't this is going to be your last question. I'm going to try and entice the Cabinet Secretary to be succinct because what I don't want to be in the position of is not giving all committee members a chance to ask their questions because that will come back to haunt me. So, sorry, Douglas, your last uh, question. Just, if you're not measuring it, how can you improve it and, and take actions to I think you measure what you can 
and you improve on that when you can. And if you measure what you can, the, the categories that I've mentioned on scope three emissions, it's a substantial amount of, of the, the work that's been done at local authorities, and you improve on that, you're going to make a massive difference. I think, um, can I quote? Uh, Silk Esbrand from the last, I actually made a note, she was, you need to use the, the data in the most effective way to drive down emissions. I think that's what, I mean, I, I think that's what you put the, the heading here. You need to use the data in order to drive down emissions. And if some of the more difficult data is hard to get, or it might be inaccurate, then it might not drive down emissions. Okay. But if you have gaps, but I'll pass back to the convener. Maybe at the end, if there's time and everyone else has asked, Douglas, uh, Monica, you've got some questions you'd like to ask. Uh, yeah, thanks, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so you were listening to the earlier session, um, so it sounds like deja vu, but highlighted in the improvement plan that government had recognised that local authorities have increasingly stretched resources and that adhering to the reporting of scope three emissions will result in additional reporting and possible additional training of staff. And I put that question um, to the panel uh, around that. Um, we heard from the panel that we don't know how much additional resources and training um, would be required um, to deliver on mandatory reporting. Um, is that correct or has the government done its own assessment of this in terms of how much resource is required? Yeah, the members of your panel were, I, I think, ent entirely accurate. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that you just you can't tell, first of all, until the methodology, it keeps on coming back to this, until the methodology is actually bottomed out, you won't know what kind of training is involved around that methodology. You'll need to have an assessment of the systems that the local authorities already have and how much of a step change that would be in terms of the, what new systems they had to put in, in terms of the cost of those systems, in terms of the, the training associated with... Uh, in terms of the, the capacity of the departments mm -hmm. that, the, that you would need. So I think until we've actually gone through the process which we've put in train of the, the, the focus group of comprising of various academics and experts in this field to actually bottom out what the methodology could look like, and then that wider piece of research. And then we actually would have to like, work with COSLA and local authorities to say, right, OK, well, this is what's come back from the focus group. This is what's come back from the research. How feasible is this, given your current capacity? How feasible is this, um, given uh, the expertise that you have available with, within, within your organisation? Do your, would your current systems support this kind of reporting? And the methodology, what's going to be so um, again at, at the risk of, of quoting Silka too much, she kept on saying how long is a piece of string. I think that's the territory they were in with this. The methodology has to come first, and then you will be able to be working with COSLA and local authorities and actually answering your question, uh, Monica. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking back, I was trying to find it there. So I asked a, a written question last year, so the response came back from uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Mary McAllen, in February last year. And um, in the response, she confirmed that a single data platform to enable consistency of approach and adoption of best practice methodologies across local authorities and delivery partners was being procured. Um, are you able to give an update on that? Yeah, that's yeah. Scot the Scottish Climate Intelligence, I keep on calling them improvement, the Scottish Climate Intelligence Service are, are actively working that, and obviously I had a representative there yeah. from today. So that will be what Ms McAllen was referring to. And obviously you'll have heard that, um, you know, that's actually a, a partnership with COSLA, mm -hmm. uh, local authorities, and um, Scottish Government have actually effectively set up this service mm -hmm. based at Edinburgh University. They're also going to be, I mean, in, in real time right now, they are work, working with local authorities and providing them with, with the, the methodology that does exist in order to, to look at their emissions. Um, so they are absolutely critical. Potentially, their work is probably most critical right now in terms of the short and medium term gains and work on the plans that the, the local authorities are going to have to put forward. Mm -hmm. Their advice, their expertise is absolutely critical, whereas in the background we'll be working with them and many others on the methodology around scope three emissions, but that's obviously going to take a lot, a lot more time 
Meanwhile, you've got the, the, the intelligence service working in real time with, with local authorities. Yeah, and that's jointly funded by Scottish Government and local government, yeah. I believe. So on that single data platform, then if, what are the sort of timelines on that? Do, do you know? I, would, I mean, I would, have to, I would have to ask them. Uh, Phil, you might not have more information. It's uh, possible that you've, you've missed your opportunity because <laughs> they were in front of you, but I, I certainly could find out for you. Unless Philip knows the answer, but you're yeah. always welcome to write to us. I think we need to write back, but my, my, my understanding is that uh, the, the work will carry on through 25. OK. OK. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Monica. <clears throat> Mark, I think you've got some questions next. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned about Council reporting on Scope 3 emissions under the different categories. How many have reported on franchises? What percentage have reported on franchises? I, I, I don't have that down. I was, I, again, I, I, I don't think any link. have report, from a list, reported on that. And I think that I, I was, it was interesting <clears throat> to see that that particular category was developed around the sort of greenhouse gas emissions reporting was developed at a very high level to look at the kind of big franchises that we all we all know about the Starbucks, the Costas, the, 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 all the fast food outlets that are like have a franchise arrangement. I don't, I mean, and I, and I was, you know, I had the same question myself. I don't think that any local authorities have actually specifically reported back on on the franchises. Phil, I, I don't know if you've got any information. We were, yeah, the examples we were discussing earlier were, you know, public transport, social care, catering. Yeah. You know, these are big areas of, of council spend. Yeah. So I am interested in how many are currently able to yeah. or willing to provide that kind of information. Well, I mean, I, I've outlined, I had my, my list in front of me of the, the various categories that they had been some reporting on. Um, and obviously there was, um, you know, there was uh, employee commuting and business yeah. travel. Have you got you know, 14 uh, franchises down there? No. I don't have it in okay, front of me. Right. Mark, it, well, really, it really is, a, it really is a, a, a perfectly acceptable question, but yeah. I just don't have the information. Okay, to my knowledge, fine. not they haven't. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I think where we've got to with this is, it is a question about where you draw the line, right? Yeah. So you could go down to the nth degree, and there's a point perhaps where that information doesn't add as much value yeah. in some areas as, as other areas. So, you know, you're working within the spirit of the ESS recommendation. You've adopted most of the uh, recommendations, but still this question around the sticky scope three. Um, I mean, I suppose what I'm, I'm interested in is how much progress can you make in bottoming out that question between 2025 and 2027, and what can you report back to Parliament? Because it's clear there will be some areas, you know, we mentioned bus franchises, which on the face of it look pretty easy to bottom out in terms of scope three emissions. I would add another one, actually, in favour of mine, road maintenance. You know, I think, Andrew's looking at me, I think, I think with road maintenance, it's fairly easy to understand the data around aggregates and around some of the reporting that's within that sector. And for councils to be able to kind of get that verified data and to include that in scope three reporting might be might be an area that would be you know perhaps low hanging fruit perhaps easier to do than say you know catering where you're trying to add up all the ingredients and all the yeah. suppliers and, and everything else so i'm just kind of interested in you know within the kind of areas that you think look it's a bit too hard right now we need to go back and think again you know how much progress can we see and are there some obvious areas which councils are not reporting on at the moment like road maintenance where actually the data is there it is quite a big um, area of carbon emissions it's also a big area of public spend wouldn't be too hard and probably would have some value in coming back and saying yes we understand what the carbon is and that's going to form part of the decision making. I think that's the assessment <coughs> that we're, we're actually currently in the middle of, of making up in, in you know, working with local authorities around this, that even, as I said, as a result of the workshops, there were two workshops that took place on around this. When we looked at the ESS report, I and mean, then we put these workshops in place with the, 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 the people in local authorities that are already dealing with sort of like various climate change plans and the emissions reductions within councils, you know, and we looked at some of the areas where, well, this would be more difficult. This we could actually probably do exactly what you're talking about. There was, there was a conversation in assessing how much could be done in this. So I think that if, if we do take forward any legislation around scope three uh, emissions reporting, that would take effect around about 2020. 26, 27, but that would be informed by the conversations we're having with local authorities, 
the areas on which we can see the benefits of reporting on certain scope three emissions, the gaps and where, we, where they haven't been reporting, but there's been an assessment actually we probably do have the data there. Let's look about how we can actually collate it. Um, and I think that anything that we bring forward legislation-wise would be informed by those, those conversations that are you know, happening uh, and, mm. and are ongoing. So what, sorry, just finally then, what does that look like in terms of reporting back to Parliament? Because I think, you know, Parliament's being asked to approve, I think, or to not stand in the way of, of your improvement plan that's come mm -hmm. on the back of an improvement notice from ESS. Um, if we so if we it do, is a moment where we're, we're going, yes, that, that's, yeah. that's good, or actually, no, we, we think you need to think again. What, if, if we're sort of broadly saying, yes, this is moving absolutely in the right direction, as I think it is, what, what, what's the reporting back to Parliament going to look like? Because there is this unanswered question around scope three emissions, and I think I would certainly want to see what progress is being made, not in 2027, we're still here, yeah. but in the, in the interim period between So if we do take uh, le well. legislation forward as a result of, obviously, you know, how the improvement plan has landed and the discussions, obviously, y yourself are having with all the stakeholders in it, the reporting to mandate Group 1 um, categories would uh, be 2025. Mm -hmm. But obviously, there's a lot more work going on on mm -hmm. the other groups as well. Yeah. And uh, as I say, a lot of it is going to be as a result of the, fo the work the focus group are doing and the wider research that's been done, as well as discussing with the local authorities about what they can do and what they might feasibly be able to do, but coming back, what they might feasibly be able to do and what action that could drive mm -hmm. critically. OK, I'm done. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to go to Jackie and then I'm going to come back on another question in just a minute. Jackie, you're next. Thank you. Um, my question is probably quite an easy one, um, Cabinet Secretary. It's just if you could reflect on the nature um, of the relationship you had uh, when you were working with Environmental Standards Scotland on their investigation and uh, this improvement plan. That is actually quite easy to answer <laughs> because um, in, in, uh, environment and uh, the, the the report that they put out um, as I say with the exception of the scope three emissions part everything they reported made absolute sense and actually in a sense it it, it was great to see that they were looking at a particular sections of Scottish society where there really is an awful lot of procurement, buy-in power, a lot of services and goods associated with them in the local authorities, and actually say, well, you know, is the legislation and are the sort of like compulsions on them fit for purpose, given that we have got a net zero target of 2045? What more <laughs> can we do to accelerate action um, with them around mandating that they put climate change plans forward, monitoring their, 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 their work on that. So actually, the, um, we were, I'm grateful for the recommendations. It's why um, the, the service was set up. You know, it was set up as a result of, 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 of Brexit so that we had environmental standards that were being looked at by an independent arm's length body that could recommend things to government and, and indeed parliament. And I think they did their job very well. That other, you know, the scope three emissions is tricky, but I think it's right that it was it was there because I think that it, all governments need to be thinking about this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hugely good manners popping up in the committee here about committee members trading questions. I think Bob, you've got the question uh, that you asked in the last panel. Well, um, thank you. I think Monica, I what you could ask further questions around it, but it was just for consistency of, of line of questioning. As I was listening to the last panel, uh, I, I was conscious that at a European level, they're grappling with all of these things also. And certainly uh, the EU is keen to see uh, corporate Europe, if you like, report on scope three uh, emissions. And of course, uh, Scotland's public sector will, will trade in the large supply chain stretching across Europe and beyond. And I just wonder what cognizance the Scottish Government takes, and we'd ask the same question to, to COSLA, there a way to think about it in relation to alignment with the methodology and everything else in relation to Europe reports and all of this and how Scotland seeks to report and all of this. Is there a connectivity? Is there ongoing work or an opportunity to start a wee bit of work around the Cabinet Secretary, perhaps? 
Well, as far as like joint work is concerned, obviously the, the biggest opportunity for joint work would be for other, the other three nations in, in the UK. I, um, I think that our improvement report and, and obviously the ESS report recommendation has prompted things maybe a little bit faster in Scotland than those other, but I think it's coming down the line. I've got a, a list of, I mean, there's no mandatory um, requirement in the UK for local authorities to report on the greenhouse gas emissions. But the Welsh Government have been doing, um, they don't have a statutory reporting uh, mechanism at the moment. They're, they're running into the same difficulties that we are. Um, I'm having really quite substantive uh, discussions with my Northern Irish and my, my Welsh counterparts in terms of our net zeros. You know, what can we do within the devolved space in order to accelerate action around this? And we actually meet regularly on this also with the UK government as well. So this will be something that will be factoring in. I think that um, I mean, I, I think that the work that we do in this area is the work that we would like to share with other countries. We'd be absolutely opening to share that. We're doing the work in the focus group. We're doing the wider research. Um, I think we should be sharing that. But I also think we should be keeping a very keen eye on what's happening in the EU, uh, because this is an issue for every single country if they want to accelerate their emissions reduction. That scope three emissions is becoming more of a... Uh, uh, a discussion point now, and it's the methodology around that that needs to be bottomed out that's going to be fair and is actually going to work. So we'll continue pressing ahead with the work that we are doing, but at the same time keeping an eye on what's happening in the European space and keeping an eye and actually influencing, I hope, what's happening in the wider UK space as well. Okay, thank you. So I'm just looking around to see if there's any further questions. Yeah. Monica. So Cabinet Secretary said, you know, keeping an eye on what's happening in the European space. Does that, if I try and translate that, does that mean keeping pace with the EU? Government wants to keep pace with the EU generally. Okay. So that is, um, we always factor that into our decision making. Okay, that's helpful. If there's no further questions, Cabinet Secretary, I'm going to ask you one last one. <clears throat> I know you always like to come to the committee and make announcements, good news announcements. So we heard in the last session, uh, from COSLA's representative that reporting scope three uh, emissions was going to take up more time and more resource. They hadn't quantified how much. Uh, will you be asking for more money uh, in the budget to ensure that COSLA have the resources for their members to ensure that they can do what you're asking them to do? Well, I think, as you've heard, we do, I cannot quantify what resource would be required. So it might be after we've done all this work, then yes, I will be going back and saying in order for, you know, for, for councils to be able to do this work, it will require more resource. But for this budget, I do not have that. Uh, that piece of string has not been bottomed out yet. Uh, so you'll be asking them to do it without the resources and the money to do it. That's they're not, slightly they're concerning. Compelled, they're not compelled to do it at the moment. OK. So won't be compelled to do it till they've got the money and the resources to do yeah, it. Yeah, and also we've got the, the, the intelligence service working with them on their emissions reduction and the data supplied for the things that we are asking them to do. OK, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That was a very helpful uh, session this morning, and I'd like to thank you and your officials for coming along. We're now going to move into private session.